turn started the recording. Thank you. We are recording. Okay. Good evening. It is July 17th, 2023. This is a regular meeting of the town council. Uh, the open meeting law has, was extended. This allows us to continue to hold meetings remotely without a quorum of the council physically present. However, we have a quorum present in the room tonight. Uh, while providing the public with adequate alternative access to the meeting. The public is also welcome to be in the room tonight. This meeting is accessible in real time via Zoom, by phone, and as a live broadcast on Amherst Media Channel 9 and live stream. Given that we have a quorum of the council present, I'm calling the July 17th, 2023 town council meeting to order at 6 31. Uh, I'll call upon each counselor by name. At that time, you should mute your unmute your mic and say present. This will indicate that you can hear us and we can hear you. Please remember to meet, mute your mic again. All right. Um, I'm going to start with Shalini Balmil. Present. Shalini is present but remote. I need to do this for the purposes of the minute taker who is remote tonight. Okay. Uh, well, one's, one's here and one's not. Okay. Uh, Patty Angelis. Present. And in the room. Anna Devlin Gothier is absent. Lynn Griesmer is present and in the room. Mandy Jo Haneke. Present in the room. Anika Lopes. Present. And in the room. Michelle Miller. Present. And in the room. Dorothy Pam. I don't see Dorothy yet. Uh, Pam Rooney. Present and in the room. Thank you. Kathy Shane. Here and in the room. Andy Steinberg. Also here and in the room. Jennifer Todd. Um, here and in the room. And Alicia Walker. I'm going to give her just a moment since the audio is just connecting. Alicia, can you hear us? Yes, I can. Thank you, Lynn. Thank you. Okay. Um, there's no chat room. If you have technical issues, please let Athena, me, Sean, Paul know, uh, and we'll decide what to do at that time. There is no change in the order of the agenda as posted. Uh, we are going to quickly just go to the town to the calendar and note that there are council meetings scheduled at this point. August 6th, 7th, I'm sorry, at 6.30 is if needed, and we'll discuss that later. And the committees are meeting as posted here. With that, we're going on to the next agenda item. There are no hearings, but we do have general public comment. And this is the only public comment this evening. And if you are in the room and would like to make public comment, please make sure that you've signed up over on this side of the room where Sean is. And if you are in on Zoom and you would like to make public comment, please raise your hand now. We are waiting to see for all the people who had to sign up for public comment, both in the room, and I've asked those who are on Zoom to raise their hands now. Okay. And Sean, how many people have signed up? 60. Okay. Uh, with that, why don't we take the first person, if you would read their name, they'll come up. State your name and where you live. Public comment is restricted to three minutes. There's a clock up on the wall and that we all can see. So, so the first name is Waylon Greeny. Okay, please come forward, Waylon. Okay. 
Good evening. My name is Wei Ling Greeny. I live on 76 McClellan Street. I'm here today as the founder and executive director of a local nonprofit organization. It's called the Amherst Community Connections. I'm here today to request that the town of Amherst consider distributing a part of the ARPA funds to organizations that have applied for the most recent round of CDBG funding, but did not receive it. Our agency is one of the agencies that didn't make it to the top five agencies that received this year's CDBG funding. As you might know, CDBG can only choose five agencies every year to fund, and we came in six. And we were severely impacted by this COVID-19. Just prior to the pandemic, our agency was funded by the CDBG funding for the work with the homeless and low income. However, during the pandemic, the town announced that it will not uh, fund any agency due to state funding. And during that same period of time that we worked extra hard, serving twice as many participants who we would like to address as people we work with, from the 400 families to 800 families, about 50% of them are from Amherst. After the pandemic, the most recent round of CDBG funding was a double funding situation. It skipped a year and doubled the funds in two years, but they can only choose five lucky nonprofit organizations, not 10, unfortunately. Well, we feel thrilled for the five lucky organizations who got double funding. Our agency is very disappointed and disheartened that we are not able to participate in this round of good fortune. It's an Asian American woman who has headed this small nonprofit local organizations in Amherst since 2000. We have applied on the, uh, for AC for the CDB for the CDBG funding seven times and receive two fundings and we yet see other same time 13 years our agencies apply every year and receive funding so I wonder about the equity issues in the CDBG funding system so in conclusion the esteemed members of the Amherst Town Council and the hard-working town manager that I urge you to consider appropriating some of the ARPA funds for Amherst Community Connections and other nonprofit organizations that applied during the double CDBG funding cycle that were not chosen in that process. I thank you so much. And you have been, uh, you have been sent an email for this uh, content of my presentation tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you. We're going to now go to the audience on Zoom, and the first person is Miranda Balkan. Please enter the room, state your name, and where you live. Um, am I unmuted? Can you hear me? We can, but you'll need to speak a little louder. Okay. Is that better? That's much better. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, hello, my name is Miranda Balkan, and I live at 591 Bay Road. Uh, I use she, her pronouns. I am an Amherst resident and a family physician. I'm a past board president of Medical Students for Choice and current medical director of Oxbow Primary Care, a family medicine clinic at Cooley Dickinson, as well as medical director for LGBTQ services at Cooley Dickinson Hospital, although I speak tonight as a private citizen. I am here to urge the council to vote yes on Councilors Haneke and Devlin Gauthier's bylaw affirming our town's support for legal and private access to reproductive and gender affirming care. I realize this is not on tonight's agenda, but I am not able to attend your GOL meetings due to patient care responsibilities. While Massachusetts state law currently protects such care, transphobic and anti-choice activists, two groups who overlap considerably, are working on as many fronts as possible to limit the bodily autonomy of people born with a uterus, as well as anybody who is not cisgender, and to interfere with medical providers' ability to exercise our clinical judgment about what is and is not appropriate care. The right combination of legislative and judicial hate could easily take away the rights we have today. My patients are terrified of this future. Every day I have conversations about mood disorders that have resurfaced because the nation is peppered with legislation taking away their rights to medical care, to parent their children, to use the bathroom. 
I have spoken to transgender people who don't leave home without their passport in case they need to flee to Canada on a moment's notice if a new worse law gets passed. I have inserted IUDs for monogamous lesbians who are worried their rights to abortion will be taken away and you never know what might happen. This bylaw will help to keep our community safe and protected and send a message of love and acceptance. Please pass it without further delay. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. We'll go back now. And I just want to remind people that have come into the room since we started, if you would like to make public comment, please go over to Sean, the gentleman with the blue shirt on and sign up, okay? Uh, Sean, what is the, who is the next person in the room that's on the list? The next person is Lauren Mills. Okay. Good evening, uh, Lauren Mills, uh, Long Meadow Drive, 12 Long Meadow Drive. Um, I am a former and continued uh, member of the Board of Health, but I am speaking from my own personal viewpoint. Um, I want to thank Vera Cage and Mrs. Pat Onu Onubaku for all of the diligence um, they have showed in bringing important community issues to the public. When we don't know ourselves, we take the role of our oppressors. We need the creativity and imagination of all of our residents. Hence the example, tale of two, two paintbrush kits. One has just one paintbrush of determination. The other a complete kit, uh, economic success, a complete kit for economic success, good trusting relationships, economic knowledge, capital, equity, institutional, and generational knowledge. Where should justice lie in our town, especially not so post COVID for many people in our community? And looking at how Amherst is choosing to distribute ARPA funds, justice should be everywhere, but are we afraid of too much justice? Now is the time for our youth to be seen and heard, whether that be through more engagement activities to know what our young people want and need in a, in a youth empowerment cultural community center, or actually, or actually um, department, departments coming up with public initiatives for social issues that have been brought forth in several surveys and the Department of Health in the Department of Health needs assessment. One of those um, needs that was prioritized or should be prioritized was mental health. Um, it was mentioned as a priority in the community needs assessment. As a and as a continued board member of the Board of Health, I would like the health department to take mental health initiatives um, seriously and um, have activities to reduce chronic stress in the most um, vulnerable areas of our population, children, students, and the elderly. I want to also thank the Amherst Municipal um, Affordable Housing Trust Committee for holding its listening session and trying to get to the root of the housing crisis in Amherst and find solutions. Where are the models of care that our children are learning in school? The school year of 2022 started with a traumatic incident on July 5th with young people being detained some say for their protection, however, it was traumatizing for them and racial, racial inequity has come up. Also, our school year ended with another traumatizing and emotional situation with students who identify as LGBTQAI also feeling their rights were ignored. Lauren, please wrap up. To the BIPOC community leaders, we also need to do better in bringing a clear vision and picture of what exactly does youth empowerment mean? Visualizing the programs that would go into a space and more importantly, who will be working with youth in developing these programs? Will it include learning focuses such as photography, learning about the built environment, cultural historic preservation, or self-reflective education? Just because we live in a college town does not mean we automatically um, are gonna go to college. We know that this is a goal that takes hard work and persistence. 
So will actualize, so will actualizing a youth empowerment center. We need to make a youth space as a priority for the remainder of the opera funds. One place my kids like to go is the Jones Library. When this closes for renovations, I believe in December, where will these um, activities be moved to? Thank you. Thank you for joining us. I wanna take a moment and make sure that Dorothy Pam can hear us. Yes, I can. Oops. You muted I, again, thank you. I, I apologize for being late. That's fine, uh, welcome. Uh, Okay, we are going to go back to the Zoom audience and the next person is Margaret Sawyer. Please enter the room, state your name, make sure you unmute, there you go, and tell us where you live. Okay, hi, my name is Margaret Sawyer. Um, I also submitted this in writing, but I, I'm glad to be here with you all to speak it. Are you able to see me? No, right? Yeah, okay. Um, uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, we can. Okay. Um, I'm a resident of Amherst. I have two children in the Amherst schools, and I serve on the board of Amherst Media. I am asking that the town council consider supporting Amherst Media in the next round of ARPA funding. We are Amherst's own independent nonprofit public access organization, and we have the distinction of being the oldest and longest operating such organization in the country. We were founded in the 1970s to help make local government more transparent and help promote communication among the people of Amherst. Today, right at this moment, we record and broadcast every town meeting and every school committee meeting, in addition to select subcommittee meetings and hearings. Our staff and interns attend in-person meetings to film them. We broadcast the meetings live on our YouTube channel and on our cable access channels and they're also archived for future viewing. We also record and broadcast different events around town and we host community members who produce their own shows. Finally, we have 30 to 50 college interns every year who come and join us for training in media and production. That's something I hadn't realized when I joined the board that it's a very competitive internship. Kids come from all of the five colleges and many have gone on into broadcasting. Amherst Media is a vital part of our town's ongoing work to have a strong, transparent government. Since we started our YouTube channel 10 years ago, we've been watched 250,000 times. This spring, over 2,000 people watched the school committee meetings that we recorded. For many years, Amherst Media has worked with the town to identify an appropriate site in which to build the Amherst Media Center. I had not also realized how many years we've been working on this together, and now we have a site it's directly across from Element Spa within walking distance from the middle and high schools. We're finalizing the building design and we believe the building will be a critical hub to further expand and lift the voices of our town to train young people in media production and to help them learn how to lift their voices. We've seen our, our young people can be amazing reporters. Supporting Amherst Media is supporting the many stories and experiences that belong to our community, over the years, we've spotlighted um, many different valuable people in Amherst um, through our Gene Haggerty Award, including um, Ellen Story, the Rotary Club, the Women's, the League of Women Voters, and many Gary and Carly Tarnikoff, and many more. We hope you'll consider supporting Amherst Media. Thanks. Thank you for joining us. Go back to the audience, Sean. Next name is Vera Cage. Good evening. My name is Vera Cage. I live at 12 Longwater Drive in Amherst. And I want to um, appeal to the town council to consider the folks that have been left out from the first round of ARPA funding. Um, you know, I think that it's American Rescue Plan Act, and we really need to focus on the existing businesses and organizations that have been in our community um, to lift them up. Uh, I think that 
the first round, we saw a lot of newer um, businesses um, being lured into our community. Um, and I think that's great, but I think that at this particular juncture, we really need to consider how do we support the ones that have been left behind um, that will probably leave our community um, if we don't shore them up. Um, as I'm looking at the data that um, has been provided by the town thus far, um, and thanks in large part to Mrs. Pat Unonabaku, um, who presides over the Black Business Association Amherst area, um, we've been able to see how much money has been awarded to which organizations, to what businesses. And there was one, you know, I think there, it, there's a lot of, uh, there are a lot of questions um, currently in my, my mind as we study that list, um, which includes a business that, you know, just established is, is, um, itself in this community, in this town in January. Um, and it was awarded technical um, assistance towards plumbing. And so we don't know what the dollar amount is for that particular business. Um, and it's located at 35 Montague Road. And um, there's not a lot, you know, that's out there about that business. Um, but we do know that it established itself in January. Um, so I will uh, stop there. Um, it's not over yet, you know, um, we're going to, keep um, asking the town for more data, for more information um, about how this expenditure um, took place. Um, it appears that there are a lot of excuses of why existing businesses didn't get the award. And that needs to be transparent. That needs to be publicly discussed and not privately um, gossiped about. Um, I think that doesn't bode well for um, the perception of trust in this community. Thank you. Bye. Thank you for joining us. If you've come into the room and you would like to make public comment, please make sure you've signed in with Sean, who's over here on the left, on my left, your right. Okay, uh, with that, we're going to go to the Zoom and the next person is Irv. And Irv, please enter the room, state your full name and where you live. My name is Irv Rhodes. I live at 173 Pondview Drive. Uh, and I sound a little hoarse because I have uh, been on the phone about 90% of the time. My wife is threatening divorce. But here is um, my, uh, my, my comment is that I have uh, and, and was on uh, some of the committees who uh, were involved with distributing ARPA funds throughout the town uh, and through, through uh, various organizations. And one of the things that I really appreciated about being on there is that how thorough the process was, how transparent it was. All the information about what was done is available on the town website through the town manager. All that information is there and nothing is hidden and that can be accessed. Um, I continue to, to believe that um, the remaining funds should be distributed on an equitable basis uh, to both um, individual agencies that are in need of it and who can demonstrate that need. I also think that uh, uh, agencies or groups, uh, business groups, et cetera, uh, should be looked at in a very serious manner, especially those groups that are connected up with other groups within the town uh, so that these funds can find their way into the places that they need to be. I, 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 I totally agree that there should be a youth center. I totally agree that there should be a community center. 
And I'm purposely not saying a youth empowerment center. I'm saying a youth center. I'm not saying a youth center just for black kids. I'm saying for all kids. I'm not saying a community center just for black people, but for all people, uh, because that's where my values are. I believe that um, businesses in town who are black, white, or otherwise, who were left out in the first round, that a way should be made so that those groups can receive funds under the same conditions and same with the same criteria that other groups who came forward and got funds are. I'm totally for that. And finally, people don't know who I am and what I stand for. I really want a cross-cultural, cross-ethnic, all background people to be involved in Amherst. I really do not believe in separation of any kind for any reason whatsoever. Thank you. Irv, thank you for your comments. I hope your voice gets better. Uh, we're going to go back to the audience. The next name is Kathleen Anderson. Vera Cage, 12 Long Meadow Drive. Amherst. Um, so uh, last town council meeting, um, we discussed the ways in which um, bias may have or um, preference um, may have been provided to the developers and landowners um, and property owners in this town organized by the Business Improvement District. Um, I understand that um, Barry Roberts is the president of the Business Improvement District. Um, and we have to look at how those funds have benefited people indirectly, right? Um, we have members in the audience today um, that are shop owners who there's one that isn't in the downtown area um, and you know was overlooked. Um, and so we we have to consider how the funds have been distributed and how it has um, enriched people indirectly and and we, we have to really look at the ethics of that. Um, we also want to look at how the town has responded to um, calls for fairness and equity. Um, when we talk about you know, existing business, black businesses not getting ARPA money, um, we're countered with, well, you know, over half went to BIPOC um, businesses, um, and in reality, you know, that statement is not taking in consideration um, what the Drake received in terms of the $300,000 um, in ARPA funding. So um, once again, um, Mrs. Pat Onanabaku, who's the number cruncher, um, has repeatedly put, you know, tried to assert this fact um, to correct um, what's been printed. Um, and I think we need to stop trying to uh, mislead people and really address the issues head on um, and really believe in the people that are presenting the data and really discuss it in a very open and honest way and truthfully. Um, because, I, you know, just like Mrs. Pat said, you know, the Drake is a business as every other business is, is a business. It's nothing special. Um, and I think that people don't know that they never went through an application process to get that $300,000 from the town. Um, but we have so many excuses as to why existing businesses are not eligible um, or that organizations like Amherst Media didn't apply because you know there wasn't an opportunity to apply. Um, 
or organizations like Amherst Media at the last round. So I'm pleased that this round um, we're being considered. And I think the community owes a lot of credit once again to Mrs. Pat Onanabaku for really being persistent about this issue and really um, seeking the justice that we all deserve. Thank you. Um, we're going to go back to Zoom and Representative Mindy Dom, who informed me in advance that she was going to try to be here, but she's stuck on the Mass Pike coming back from Boston. Uh, so Mindy, please enter the room. You can state your name and where you live. Thank you. I pulled over. I just want to assure people I'm currently not driving, but I apologize. I very much wanted to be there in person, um, but unfortunately a meeting in the State House went later and I got caught in traffic, so my apologies. I'm Mindy Dom. I'm the state representative for the 3rd Hampshire District. I hope you can hear me. Um, I'm here today to share suggestions regarding the allocation of round two in ARPA funds for the town of Amherst. My suggestions are in response to the town's presentation at the June 26th town council meeting and your invitation to the public to share ARPA spending priorities. My recommendations are based on the needs provided by the town to my office and those described to me by residents. But first, I want to express my appreciation for the work that has occurred in identifying needs for ARPA funding, the distribution process used thus far, and the allocation decisions made in round one. The purpose of my speaking tonight is to share my thoughts on priorities for the town of Amherst in its round two spending. And I will be focusing, as I mentioned, on projects that have been brought to my attention and that have been described to me as urgent and have a significant price tag. I understand that of the $4.9 million available in round two, $600,000 is committed, leaving $4.3 million to be allocated. So first, ARPA and infrastructure. And forgive me for speaking quickly, but I, I think I'm going to go over and I'm going to try to be very quick. In a February 2023 memo, the town provided a list of capital projects to our office. Based on this information, Amherst residents would benefit from ARPA spending on two projects in particular, the upgrades and renovations to the water treatment plant and more funding for roads and sidewalks. I would like to suggest that a significant amount of ARPA funding in round two be dedicated to these critical and expensive needs. As a result of recent weather events, there may be other infrastructure needs that also increase in priority, including dam repairs. The water treatment plant was described to us as having a top priority with a projected cost of $4 million. I understand the town has received a no interest loan for this project. ARPA funds offer a unique opportunity to cover those costs. The need for this project was described as, quote, critical to preserving the town's water supply for the next 100 years. Construction costs have dramatically escalated during COVID due to supply and labor shortages, causing the total price tag for this project to exceed what has been authorized by the council. The town has secured a state revolving fund loan. We need another funding source or the cost will need to be absorbed by the water enterprise fund negatively impacting residential water rates, unquote. Roads and sidewalks. I'm very aware of the relentless nature of road and sidewalk repairs, the need for more sidewalks, the escalating costs for this effort, the town's very strong advocacy for more state funds to address this need, and its assessment that the local need regularly exceeds the state funding and our capacity to secure additional support. Designating a specific substantial amount of funding from ARPA to address the regular shortfalls in this area would respond to this need and help make Amherst a more walkable, rollable, and accessible town. Using funding for ARPA funding for some of these substantial projects could also advantage future town applications for state resources. I want to just note the town's list also included net zero improvements for the new elementary school, as well as solar canopies for parking lots, both of which may be able to seek alternative sources of government funding at the state or federal level. 
I also believe that reserving additional funds, and forgive me for going late, I'm speaking as quickly as I can. I also believe that reserving additional funds in this category for eviction prevention with the Family Outreach of Amherst program would be a strong move to preserve housing status for Amherst residents. The town may want to consider expanding the eligibility for this assistance to cover additional debts which individuals or families have incurred in their attempt to stay housed. These debts could include, for example, utilities, credit cards, medical expenses, and phones. In terms of child care, in recent Mindy, meetings with Mindy, can you wrap up? Yes, I will. I'm just going to. I'm going to talk about child care and then small business, if I may. They'll both be brief. In recent meetings with providers in our region, I've learned about the deep relationship between the shortage in providers and the need for better reimbursement rates. I believe the state is beginning to meet the reimbursement challenge. However, perhaps creatively determining how ARPA funds could be used to provide local one-time hiring bonuses could result in the increase in local providers that is required to staff the slots we need. Um, I, there's other things, but I'll, put, I'll submit this in writing. I want to also share that I've reached out to the Executive Office of Economic Development to begin conversations around having a public roundtable in Amherst related to small business grants that are available at the state level. I want to take this opportunity to pledge to work with all interested in parties, including this council, to make such a meeting happen quickly, hoping this will help maximize participation in these grant opportunities and bringing more state resources to our community for small businesses. I've also spoken with Congressman McGovern about including the Small Business Administration into this conversation. I believe these comments reflect the priorities that have been brought to my attention by the town, and I thank you for the opportunity I'll submit this in writing to the council, which also includes additional items. Thank you. Thank you. Pat, you have your hand up. Use your microphone, please. Thank you. Can you hear? Um, we're going what to I go. said was, if we're going to institute three minutes, it needs to be on a consistent basis, no matter how much I respect Representative Dom, she should not have been allowed to go on so long. Thank you. Um, I'm going to go back to the audience. The next name is Pat Anambanku. Good evening. Can people hear me? Yes. Oh. Oh. Just keep leaning towards the mic, please. Oh. Thank you. Is that better? Yes. yes. Oh, Thanks. Okay. okay. So thank you again for the opportunity to speak very briefly. I want to start by thanking Ames Indy for publishing uh, a letter that I sent to you all earlier today. And I'll urge audience and other readers to go to MSND and read my letter. I don't want to repeat what I wrote for the sake of time. And basically, what I try to do on behalf of, oh, I didn't even introduce myself, Pat Onanibako from Tamarack Drive. I apologize. Um, so I, I don't want to repeat what I wrote, but basically, what I've been trying to do since last year is to call attention to injustice and corruption and uh, favoritism in, uh, in the distribution of uh, business uh, within the business community through the upper funds. So now we have $4.9 million left. I will caution and urge the town council our town manager to use most of the funds to our residents who have been negatively impacted by COVID pandemic. There are people who are still struggling, 
who can even have three bills a day, there are people who have high credit, uh, credit card, housing, utilities, care, repair, childcare. I am not in support of using some of that money for road, road repair. I'm sorry. I think most of the money should go to benefit our residents, our businesses, not only black uh, owned businesses, but other businesses who have been struggling. You know, last meeting, I heard one of the counselors saying that our town is doing so great, even though we don't have economic director and most of the uh, spaces are filled. You know, when I listen to that as somebody who have done business in this town, what that counselor failed to think and recognize is that the fact that some businesses are renting spaces doesn't mean that everybody is making it. How many people has this counselor actually go to their businesses to ask, you know, how are you doing? Are we only here to protect the rich landlords renting out? Do we really care about the businesses? This is a, a seasonal town. And in the summer, it gets very slow. So we have to be careful about we're doing great. You know, downtown is coming back, economic, whatever. It's not, it's, not, it's not like that for everyone. We also need to think about when we talk about businesses, it shouldn't be only downtown. During pandemic, there are, there are businesses, black owned business that were on the front line, taking care of your neighbors who are elderly, disabled people who were distributing a PPE and who, you know, do we, did we get that kind of accolade? No, we didn't. So we just, we should think about when it comes to who is contributing to economic uh, contribution in this town, it should not only be bid or chamber of commerce. Not everybody belongs to that. I also want to state about rumors that is going on, the reasons why some people didn't get funding in the, in the beginning. I actually took my time to research the federal uh, final rule on APA funds. And basically, there's nothing that says you have to have five taxes as a business to get it, or EIN. You can have the social security number to uh, if the uh, screening committee wants to know, but the APA funds is meant, if, if it even stated you can give cash to residents to meet their needs. I urge people, please take your time and read the upper final rule. What happened in our town is shameful. I think our problem in this town, we want peace, but when the people in power refuse to acknowledge mistakes, it makes situation worse. And I don't want to repeat what other people said, but see what happened, the fiasco with July 5th, what is happening in, in middle school and the upper funds. I would think that as leaders, when issues come up, you get in front of the issue and try to make it go away and, and resolve it and own up the aspect that you're responsible for. All what we are asking for BBAA is for the town leaders to acknowledge, including bid director, and said, yeah, we were in perfect. We tried our best. We hear you, BBAA. That's all we're asking for. But we didn't get that. Instead, there was like falsehood spread around everywhere. And I want to conclude by thanking so many people over several weeks. I've been very overwhelmed with personal texts messages, emails, phone calls. I want to thank my fellow BBAA members. I also want to publicly thank um, uh, our representative, uh, McGovern, that came to BBA event. Uh, his aide today, we met with him again today at the, uh, the aid, And we did reach out to uh, uh, Dom and also to Joe Comerford prior to um, um, 
uh, McGovern. And we're looking forward to working with Dom. If, if she responds, we reach out to, to her earlier in the beginning. So um, I want to thank everybody for, for your support and the council, some of the counselors who have you know, reached out. Um, I want peace, but peace can only happen when justice is addressed and it has not been addressed. Let's take our time and figure out how to spend the $4.9 million. When I hear that you know, we need roads, we need cash reserve, I just feel like, who are these people representing? This town belongs to all of us and not to the powerful and, and elected people. Yes, you guys are elected to represent us, but sometimes I feel that some of you do not represent me or um, people who look like me is the fact. I know my time is up. I am wondering um, what was next. I hope that would be a robust public forum on APA funds because I worry about outreach of people who don't speak you know, English, you know, translation. I, I want investigation on how BID got, you know, got $300,000 on Drake. There's still a lot of you know, transparency issue that is still not out there. I hope we take our time this time and get it right. And let's spend significant amount of the money remaining for the people who really with child care, for you know, people with uh, disability and, you know, and so on and so forth, so that it will reflect broad base of our community. Thank you. I'm going to return to the Zoom audience and I am going to now go back and reinforce the three minute rule. I've already been chastised by one of my counselors and I really don't wanna have that happen again. Thank you. Um, the next person is Calvin Dingra. Please enter the room, restate your name because I am sorry if I mispronounced it and where you live. Yeah, uh, my name is Calvin Dingra. I live 49 Castro Lane in Amherst. Uh, I'd like to thank Shalini Balmil for uh, inviting me to speak um, uh, in support of the BIPOC Youth Center. Um, I believe that, so I believe that youth should be part of the committee. Um, I think that as youth of Amherst, um, we can provide unique insight onto um, certain issues um, that the center should focus on, specifically education. Um, uh, specifically the schooling system, um, education uh, in regards to the high school, um, in regards to language barriers that are, are seen um, in the high school um, and really through the entire district. Um, but specifically, I'm speaking from experience with the high school. Um, language barriers, um, lack of support maybe for BIPOC students um, in the high school. Um, a lack of diversity in AP classes and honors classes. Um, yeah, I think those are just some base issues, but I, I think that um, the youth of Amherst can provide uh, an element, especially given that it's a youth center that um, is needed. So thank you. I'm not gonna go over. Thank you for joining us. Uh, back to the audience. Next name on the list is Dennis Vandal. Hello there. My name is Dennis Vandal and uh, good evening to all of you. Um, can you hear me okay? Yes, we good. can. Thank you. Uh, I, I come here this evening. Oh, my name is uh, Dennis Vandal and I live at 173 Columbia Drive here in Amherst. Uh, I, uh, I come here this evening uh, basically to uh, ask uh, on behalf of the Senior Center uh, for uh, a, a sig significant portion of ARPA funding as well. Uh, it, the, uh, the Senior Center is uh, one of those little entities that uh, provides remarkably important services to uh, about 5,500 members of our community. Uh, and these are the people who are over the age of, let's say, 55 
or so, many more of whom are, of course, retired. And um, in recent years, uh, instead of actually gaining space, we've actually wound up losing space during the pandemic. And now we're looking to get it back because activities are increasing. And so we need more space and we also need greater facilities for feeding the hungry. And that's mainly done with uh, uh, improvements that will be done with the kitchen that we're looking to, uh, to have improved. Uh, these things are really very important, mainly to feed the hungry uh, with the, uh, the congregate dining program and also for um, uh, exercise, uh, providing space for the exercise programs that are also really very much needed in terms of eliminating hunger and also for uh, providing uh, exercise and, and a healthy uh, movement for senior citizens in this town. Um, I'll basically keep it brief and uh, my, my remarks brief. Um, these things are needed because our town has not been in the forefront of elder care while other communities have done remarkable strides uh, such, as, uh, such as Hadley, uh, such as Ludlow, many other communities really have remarkable senior centers now. And uh, we're sort of, we need some updating. We need some improvement. And uh, that's what I'm here to, improve, uh, to ask you for. To wrap it up, probably the most important thing that I can offer is that the senior center, regardless of gender, regardless of race, regardless of sexual orientation or anything else. The senior center takes care or offers services to everyone who hopefully will get old. And that is mainly, or older, yeah. <laughs> and that happens mainly because, uh, it, oh, let's just say it happens to all of us in the blink of an eye. And that's what I ask you to keep in mind when you're looking for, uh, when you're looking to allocate uh, ARPA funding uh, in the future for, uh, especially for the, the Amherst Senior Center. That's it. Thank you for your comments. Thank you very much. We're going back to the Zoom audience, Mark Barrett. Please enter the room, state your name and where you live. Hello, my name is Mark Barrett. I live at, um, let's see, Nine Chestnut Court in Amherst. And I also am uh, asking the members of the council to consider spending money on the senior center. Um, I go there quite often. They have a lot of variety of programs, but we would like to do more. Uh, we have a exercise room that we can't even use. Um, there is brand new equipment that's not being used. Uh, we have a kitchen that is totally outdated, and the health department won't even let us make anything more than a cup of coffee. So we cannot feed people. Uh, we cannot have activities for people. Uh, the building itself needs a lot of work because it has been really let go over the years. Uh, we know our neighbors have built new senior centers, and we are willing to work with what we have, but we need help. And I'm hoping that the members of the senior community uh, can be considered when you're thinking about spending the money or some of the money uh, so that we could have a win-win situation for both the seniors and also for the town where the bank center could be used for other functions. And if we upgrade those uh, kitchen and that kind of stuff. So once again, I thank you very much for listening to me. Um, and I do hope that the uh, members will consider it very uh, fondly if they can uh, pass some money along to us. Thank you very much. Okay. For the audience in the room, the next person. The next name is Ed Cage. Hello, everyone. Ed Cage. Uh, I'd like to yield my time to...
If you don't, I will, I'm not going to waste the time. Too bad, I say. Thank you, Mr. Cage. Uh, my name is Emil Karsh Baz. I live at 29 um, Chapel Road. I uh, am serve on a um, town appointed uh, committee, but I do not speak here today um, as a representative of that committee, but just for um, my own uh, um, opinions on this matter. The um, senior lives matter. Um, LGBTQIA identified lives matter. And we also say here, Black Lives Matter. Um, if that is the case, then it is important to recognize how Black businesses, Black-owned businesses, uh, serve to anchor the uh, the Black community here in Amherst. Um, one of you referred uh, recently about the importance of businesses to help uh, alleviate our, our our revenues that our town needs. That it's not all resting on the property taxes, and that is a that is a valid point. But within, but there are other functions as well to the business community, and there being a diverse business community. Every year, I I welcome in my role at at my job at the University of Massachusetts. Uh, new students that come, new graduate students in particular, who come and have to find a place to stay. Uh, new faculty that come, whether in my own department, like our new chair that came in last year, who did become an Amherst resident, and we were, I was personally ecstatic about that. Uh, colleagues of mine that come uh, to uh, Amherst College, um, uh, one of whom also became an, uh, an Amherst resident uh, that arrived here, uh, Professor Bradley, very recently. So, you know, this is important, but a lot of times they don't. They opt for, I mean, everywhere other than Amherst. They opt for, for Hartford and commute on, you know, obscene distances to come in on the days in which they teach. And uh, they, they, they opt for Springfield, they opt for Hadley, they opt for Northampton. And it's hard to give them a point, the points for, for Amherst. Some of them don't have children. Some of them are not looking to have children. So it can't just be, oh, we have the great schools. We have the greatest schools. There's got, but when they can see the business community that represents them, that looks like them, that plays the music they play, that cut the kind of hair or groom, uh, uh, offer grooming services for the kind of, of hair and, 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 and things that they need, products that they need. When they have uh, uh, folks that are dealing with the cultural aesthetic that they are a part of, this serves as to, to say, oh, well, I'm welcomed here. And so I think we, we have to look at the investment in black businesses as a real strategic investment in securing the, the black community here in Amherst. I'll stop there, thank you. Thank you for joining us. Uh, I'm going to go back to the Zoom audience. Esolda Ortega Bustamante, please enter the room, state your name and where you live. Good evening, Isolda Ortega Bustamante, South Amherst. Can everyone hear me? We can, but yes, we can. Okay, I, I can, can be louder, louder if needed. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, and I am uh, going, going to make very quick points here, given, given the time. time. Um, for the past 22 years, I have been either as an applicant or as a volunteer involved in applications for state, federal, and private funding, both public, corporate, and foundational. Uh, in this capacity, I have certainly learned the ins and outs of uh, the pitfalls and the joys and, uh, and disappointments of, of applications. Um, given that experience, um, I was also invited to sit on review committees uh, for uh, other applicants for grants by uh, organizations in the region and in the state. I have also sat on scholarship review committees uh, for the Community Foundation of Western Massachusetts, where I was a trustee for a few years. I have never had the opportunity, um, and perhaps I should say the temerity, to remain in an application process 
in which any in any way there would be even the appearance of a conflict of interest. Um, I do not know the details of every decision, every person who sat, exactly what they did, but I urge you, given the groundswell of uh, protest and investigation, to have a review process that uh, sheds light and transparency and reestablishes trust or at least attempts to reestablish trust in the system. It's very fragile. And, the, and handling public funds, particularly federal funds that are recovery, is, is an incredible responsibility. If you in any way are related to any organization that can benefit from such a process, as we can see in Northampton, such individuals, colleagues included, <laughs> were asked to step out of the process. Um, if businesses do continue to need help, I urge them to look to the support of the Greater Northampton Chamber of Commerce, where we are looking at um, always to support small businesses. Finally, on the mental health front for youth, I have to quote very, very quickly, if I can have um, dispensation of, of just a second, but the last survey, which surveyed all eighth, 10th, and 12th graders in Hampshire County, um, which is conducted every year by the highly regarded norms tested uh, survey of the Spiffy Coalition in um, collaboration with educators, all of the school districts, et cetera. Um, overall for Hampshire County, and this is publicly available and I have a slide here, all overall for Hampshire County, youth um, asked uh, whether they had been uh, sad or depressed um, in the past week. And we had 57.6% of Black youth, 60.5% of Latino youth, and overall for youth, incredibly high, obviously, uh, vulnerable populations, LGBTQIA, and others. Um, and, and overall, um, you know, an astounding 82% of parents, students had been sad or depressed in the past week, and the majority of all students. And so I hardly agree on the focus as well as um, everything else has been stated on youth participation and mental health. Thank you very much. Did I make it? <laughs> uh, we're back to people in the audience. The last name we have is Amukar Shabazz. Thank you, Milkar Shabazz, South Amherst again. This time I would like to speak more specifically to my own uh, experience as part of having a family business. Um, before COVID, we had started a family uh, business, Black Star Livery, and uh, we had a bust. We had contracts with the University of Massachusetts Workforce Development, taking uh, uh, folks to training sessions uh, um, across the state. Uh, we had uh, we did local uh, services uh, on busy nights, uh, moving students to and fro uh, safely to uh, uh, and and to keep people who might be drinking from uh, from driving. We had um, um, took people to airport runs. We we worked with a lot of the elderly, um, and we hired a number of drivers for that. Uh, of course, when COVID hit, we uh, pretty much suspended operations. Uh, Patrick Chapman back in the back of the room uh, housed our um, large bus that we had for uh, for many many a year. Thank you, Patrick Chapman, for that. Um, we um, and and other of our vehicles we we've gone ahead and, and liquidated at this point. We'd like to start back up, and uh, where there is support for this. Um, it would be great. I'd like to introduce my son, Amilcar Shabazz Jr. in the back. He was one of our uh, really fabulous drivers. He's, he gets letters all the time from insurance companies uh, astounded by his, his excellent driving record that want to uh, offer him insurance, uh, uh, car insurance, but he's, he's quite fine where he is. 
um, he's ready to go back, you know, and, and, and doing things, helping uh, our Amherst neighbors, our, our elders to get to appointments that they might need. Don't want to operate on an Uber basis. There are too many issues with, with those kinds of uh, car services. We'd like to just be a locally operated. People call, people sign up, people subscribe, and they can get to and fro. But these are the kinds of things that we can do where there is, uh, you know, where there is support for these kinds of uh, 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 business activities. So just trying to give you, um, and, and let, let me say this, where certain businesses may not have had things right, I often wonder with those who were giving out the monies, uh, even my good friend Irv Rhodes, what were the follow-up to some of those businesses that applied that were turned down, that were minority-owned, that were African-American-owned? Did, did anyone go and say, hey, let's talk about uh, uh, this, this reason that we, we had to disqualify you? How can we help you? How can we get you to uh, um, you know, be in line for, for next time around? You know, these are the ways that if we, you know, want to to really, again, think about the strategic investment that that black businesses offer wherever they are and, and other black organizations, black churches, for that matter, faith based organizations, if we see them as important, this is where we can help. Thank you. Uh, from the Zoom audience, Lev Benezra, please enter the room, state your name and where you live. Hey, I'm Lev Benazra. Um, I live in Greenfield, Massachusetts, uh, but I'm speaking as the executive director of the MR Survival Center. So yes, first, before I continue, I'll just confirm that that's okay because I'm not a resident of Amherst. Can I continue? Please, please go ahead. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, thanks so much to everyone who has spoken. As you consider additional projects for round two, I would like to consider the council to really uh, encourage devoting additional resources to support basic needs of area residents living with very low incomes. The rising costs that we're seeing of food, rent, and other basic needs, along with the end of COVID benefits and dramatic cups to SNAP, to, sorry, to SNAP, formerly known as food stamps, are leaving many families struggling deeply. This is something that I see daily at the Emerald Survival Center, um, as we are now serving 33% more people every month than during the highest peaks of the pandemic. Our meals program has grown more than fourfold compared to 2019. And we regularly hear from folks who come for the first time saying things like, I never thought I would need us, or we hear from families that we've known for years about what a lifeline it is. So um, I would like to state that we are incredibly grateful for the funds that were awarded to the Amherst Survival Center in round one. This is helping support free grocery delivery to Amherst residents. And if it were feasible, I know there are many competing priorities, additional ARPA funding in round two would be incredibly helpful as we stretch to meet dramatically rising need. We're navigating compounding and really serious factors of this incredible rise in need that just continues every month. It's far beyond anything we've seen in the organization's history. At the same time as we are seeing an end of COVID grants, decrease in individual donations, and a very significant decline in food received from the food bank and other donation sources that's requiring us to dramatically increase our purchased food. As we navigate these challenges, it's incredibly important that we continue and strengthen our focus on food access and belonging across language, across identity, country of origin, physical ability, transportation, and family sizes. Um, over the last year, our food pantry, for example, has provided free groceries, now two full weeks worth of groceries each month to every household to 2,592 Amherst residents, folks who shopped on site, picked up curbside orders, or received grocery delivery. Um, and this was a really significant increase from the roughly 2,000 Amherst residents the year before. We expect next year to be higher st still. I really hear and appreciate um, other comments tonight stating the importance of supporting organizations and small businesses who have not yet received ARPA funds. Um, and beyond the Amherst Survival Center, I strongly encourage you to prioritize basic needs and area residents living with low incomes. This is truly a scary time for many 
that unfortunately seems to be getting worse and not better. So I really, really appreciate all of the comments tonight. I'm always inspired by the engagement and leadership of residents of this town. So thank you to everyone who has come out and to the council. Thanks for letting me speak. Thank you. Uh, from the audience in the room? We, uh, oh, oh, I'm sorry. Um, I'm gonna try and pronounce your name correctly this time. Amokar Shabazz. Oh, Junior, sorry about that. I guess I should have read the Junior part. Hi. Uh... My name is Emil Carr Shabazz Jr. Uh, I live at 29 Chapel Road. Um, so uh, I guess my comments are really about um, transparency. Um, you know, uh, I, uh, I'm not very politically active, but um, I try to do, I try to vote more often. Um, and when I go down to the, to vote, um, for elected officials or different uh, policies. Um, I really have a lot of faith and I hope that psychically, you know, even though I don't understand the, the total policy that I'm voting for or the person that I'm voting for, I, I really hope that, you know, they do the right thing. And, um, you know, uh, for a while I lived in uh, Florence and, I got to see a bit of Northampton and hear about the things that they are trying to do. And, um, you know, we were definitely first in the area um, to try to tackle something like reparations. Um, but uh, they also are trying to do this as well. And um, the particular attitude that they have is that even if they can't uh, provide um, assistance to uh, the current population of Northampton that is black. Um, they're they're trying to make opportunities for more black people to live in their city, and that I feel like is, you know, really different. I feel like in in Amherst, you know, uh, the things that we try to um, allow to happen. Um, and to promote and 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 try to um, uplift people here. Um, I feel like if we just listen more to the people that um, that that need the help and um, and ask for it um, and, and did more to um, have more more uh, transparency, um, I really feel like. Um, our culture would improve here. Um, I, I, uh, I don't know. I, I guess I just by living in different towns, um, still in the area, um, I see I see very different attitudes that people have, um, and I and I just hope that um, that this uh, situation continues to be transparent and people listen to each other and. Um, we uh we we really try to get policies that benefit people here. Okay. Thank you for joining us. Kathleen Traphagen, please enter the room, state your name and where you live. Hi, uh, thank you for having me speak. My name is Kathleen Traphagen and I live in District 2 um, on Southeast Street in Amherst. Um, I would like to first of all thank Ms. Pat and the other folks that are involved in the Black business. Association of Amherst Area, and also Vera Cage for the work that they've done over the past few months to amplify what, where the money really went, particularly around where the dollars went, as opposed to the percentages, which was um, really eye-opening for me, and I hope for a lot of you, um, all of you. I also want to thank Councillor Walker for the work that she's done around this. Um, so I wanted to say that this money is supposed to be rectifying the damage done by COVID. And we all know that we all did not suffer the same damage from COVID. Communities of color suffered much more damage in people lost, in grief, 
in mental health, in stress, in jobs lost, in economic lost, than generally the white population. And yet, when I looked at the proposed list of projects that, thank you, um, President Griesmeyer, for sending that in email to your constituents, I didn't see any of that mindset reflected in the proposed list of projects for round two, like a solar cover for the high school parking lot or roads and sidewalks. Um, it just seemed like this, there's no strategy and no mindset to actually repair harm that was done. So I think that in almost entire list of projects, except for where you're talking about community-based organizations needs to be rethought. I think you should listen to the Black Business Association of Amherst area, and in fact, consider shifting power over to them for some of this money in the same way that you shifted your power over to the bid for the first round. Um, I also think that it would be great to take seriously and listen to the amazing work that's been done over several years by the community and uh, justice. There's been a couple of different names for this committee. I think they were first the Community Safety and Justice Committee, and then they were the, the Social Justice Committee. Um, there have been a lot, a lot of work done around why we need a BIPOC Youth Empowerment Center and the groundwork for that, I think you should seriously consider funding that. There also was an enormous amount of groundwork done about how to get a resident advisory board, which I don't know if that work has been sufficiently listened to and used. I noticed that there was quite a, there was some tens of thousands of dollars that were being set aside for a consultant to do that. I'm happy that that's actually going to move forward, but I think if we could just look at whether we need to spend all that much money to do that, because a lot of that groundwork was done in the first report, which is now three or four years old. Um, and so if people could go back to that and look at that again. Um, so that's all I've got. Thank you so much for listening to me. Have a good night. Thank you. Are there any other people from the audience? Okay, and we are done also. So public comment has concluded. Uh, we wanna thank all of you. I just wanna mention that there are five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12 people in the audience with us tonight here in person and online there at this point, there's 21 and that's about where we've been all night. Uh, that does not include everybody who's watching through Amherst Media or on their phone or whatever else. So uh, that concludes public comment. I, for the town council, and I want to thank all of you for being here. For the town council, we are going to go on to our consent agenda. And um, that is, we're going to show that on the screen. I want to mention that as in the past, these items were selected because they were considered to be routine and it was reasonable to expect they would pass with no controversy. However, I do want to mention two things. You can ask to remove an item and that does not require a second. In addition to that, you may say, you know, I'm willing to vote for this as part of the consent agenda, but when we get to that item on the agenda, I'd like to hear a little more about it. Okay, because that uh, some of these, particularly around conservation land and so forth, are new. Dorothy, did you have your hand up for the consent agenda? I, I had a question. Um, I'm sorry that I entered late. Uh, we had the public comment on ARPA funds. Will counselors have a chance to speak on ARPA funds tonight? Yes. When okay. we have Thank our discussion period, which is item seven on the agenda. Okay. Thank you very much. Absolutely. Um, so the motion that I'm seeking a second on, but unless I'm pulling something off, is um, to move the following items and the printed motions there under and approve those items as a single unit. Authorization of Community Resources Committee 
to hold a public hearing on proposed amendments to bylaw 3.488 stretch energy code. Uh, adoption of amendments to the following conservation restrictions. And I want to note that one of these has been pulled earlier today. So it is only 8B, Lower um, Market Hill Road and Flat Hills Road, Amherst, Mass. And 8D, uh, D, Groves, 69, Shootsbury Road, Pelham, Mass. 8I, adoption of the flag policy. 8J, adoption of amendments to the town council policy regarding control and regulation of the public ways. 8K, rescission of bylaw 3.35 parades and public meetings. 9A, 1 to 8, approval of town manager appointments. And 11A, approval of June 26, 2023, regular meeting minutes. Are there any items councilors would like removed to be voted for later? Kathy? Yes, I'd like to remove 8A authorization to hold a public hearing. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, when we come back to that, we will ask Kathy to sp uh, speak to that, okay? Uh, I see no other hands and, s I'm sorry, yes. I also have some questions on 8J, adoption of amendments to the policy regarding control and regulation of public ways. I didn't think that was going to be on the agenda tonight. Uh, we did do a first reading at the last meeting. So the second reading would be tonight, but we'll pull it off the consent agenda and we can discuss that later. Okay. All right, are there any others? All right, then I'm seeking a second. I've removed item 8A and item 8J. Second, Mandy. Okay. Um, we'll begin the vote, Pat DeAngelis. Aye. Anna Devlin Gothier is absent. Lynn Griesmer is an aye. Mandy Johanneke. Aye. Anika Lopes. Aye. Michelle Miller. Aye. Dorothy Pam. Yes. Pam Rooney. Yes. Kathy Shane. Yes. Andy Steinberg. Aye. Jennifer Taub. Yes. Alicia Walker. Yes. Shalini Belmilm. Yes. It's unanimous with one, with 12 Councilors voting in favor and one absent. Um, okay, with that, we have no resolutions and proclamations, uh, given that I anticipate. Huh? Can you use your phone. microphones, please? She have, has been booted out of Zoom. Let's move the consent agenda off the screen. And we need to pause while we bring. Okay. So we have both Michelle Miller and Pam Rooney have been disconnected. But you were there for the vote, correct? Yes. Okay. Okay, Michelle is back on. Yeah, I'm going to suggest we take our break and we reconvene at eight o'clock. Meantime, we'll try to um, correct the technology glitches. Okay. And when you're gone, please turn your mic off and your video off. So Pam, you're, you're reconnected. Huh? 
you ask why the planet is going to look a little foggy the next time. If they're in the room, if not, they can hear me. So I was confused when I made them, and I think I was the the No. Okay, yeah, we'll start with that problem. Sorry, so we have to be now. Yeah, I mean, I can understand that. And I have expected somebody to well, say, well, could we be passing this is going to create some kind of reality? These are changes we need to have to do. I don't really let me, I don't really let me have that. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. And then she gets the thing and she gets the thing. 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 She gets the thing.
Sean, would you please unmute the town room? There's no audio. The town room is muted. Okay. Thank you. When you return, please turn on your video so I know you're returned. Jennifer, you need to turn your video on. It's okay. Michelle, thank you. One, two, three, four, six. Okay. Nick and Shalini. All right. In the interest of trying to complete our meeting, Alicia, you have a question. So I'm going to actually do the meeting again. And Alicia, please forward your question. Alicia, maybe you're not back yet. I am sorry. It had me in the audience at first, but I am back. Oh, I'm so far. I'm sorry. Thank you. Did you have a question? No, oh. I just wanted to be brought in from the audience. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. If you're back, please turn your mic. I mean, please turn your video back on. Okay. We're going to move to presentations and discussion. Um, the uh, First is regarding the town manager's report. Uh, it's a follow-up report uh, and it's on the American Rescue Plan Act funds. And this is the opportunity for counselors to ask questions and or make comments. Okay, Paul. Great, thank you, Lynn. So on June 26th, we provided an update on the status of the funds that were awarded. Um, we noted that they were aligned with the goals of the town council and met the needs of many of the town residents and um, needs of the town. Uh, we we're very grateful to the federal government for the funds, and we we're very proud of how we allocated them. Um, last week, we talked about the funds that were not expended and we could reallocate, and then we have funds that we had held back in terms of the second tranche, which quote added to $4.9 million, as was noted. And we throw out some ideas on how we could present, how we could allocate those funds um, to the council and basically ask for feedback. And we had very rich feedback, both in writing, a lot of written comments uh, in addition to the rich comments that we heard tonight. So tonight, uh, Sean Mangano is here with, with me. We're here to listen to you and to hear what your, um, what your priorities are, because we want to make sure that we are aligned with where the council wants to be in terms of allocating the funds. Um, so I'm, don't, I'm not going to say more than that, except, you know, there is a, we're here to listen. There's a document in your packet oh, yeah. that is comprised of questions that were forwarded to the town manager in advance of the meeting. You may have additional questions and you can ask them now. I also want to remind people that while the town manager has come to us for input, we actually do not make the decision about where the money is going, okay? So the floor is open. Dorothy. Um, first, I would like to say that there are many, many excellent suggestions uh, of places that deserve, need, and should get ARPA funds or, or additional funding. But I see this next disbursement as a kind of double checking, making sure that um, things are fair and balanced. And I would say um, of all the things, and there's so many good causes that, that have been brought up, um, I think of two forgotten areas, two neglected areas. Um, and the first one is the seniors. Um, the idea of having a working kitchen and having more space 
is um, has been presented as, in terms of practical terms, but uh, we have to also think about what was the purpose of senior centers. It wasn't that seniors were starving to death. It was that seniors were alone. They were lonely. They needed to eat in communal meals, not because they didn't have food in their house, but because they needed it for um, social, intellectual, and emotional well-being. And that's the heart of the senior center movement. And I, as I think I've told you before, I was a director for a number of years of a senior center, which had incredible fabulous food. That meant that people from all walks of life came in to get this incredible dinner, socialized, got along with each other, and, and it was a very democratic thing. It wasn't like, oh, these are hungry people, we've got to feed them. It was, this is to make the life better of seniors. Now, we've talked a lot about young people and how they have been hurt by COVID, and we know this is a very big truth. Uh, seniors, being older, have in fact been more resilient, but Many seniors, particularly people who live alone, have had a very quiet and lonely couple of years. So senior centers are extremely important. And I, I want to say that, that the, I'm not saying the other su source suggestions are not good, but I think that that is a major, major place where we should put some ARPA money. And the second one is the, the topic you heard many speakers on today, which is to make sure that the Black Business Association um, feels that they're, they have been heard and that the local black business community of existing and new businesses feels that they have had a fair chance. Um, I am not going to say that anything was done wrong, but I'm going to say, yes, there is appearance of impropriety. And you, you know, we don't need to have that. We don't need to have that. And I think that any more time spent in saying of uh, each side, you know, saying you didn't do this or somebody said, oh yes, we did this. I'm tired of listening. I have to assume that the people who did what they did, did it with good reasons and with, with a fair conscience, okay? But we're not perfect. We're not perfect. And we go and we're happy with the people we know and we often work and associate with the people we know. Um, I'd, I'd hate to have it be that um, a business gets funded because it's gonna be located in a bid owned property um, or somebody who's a bid member, but who's paid up, pay up, pay the dues up to date, because that is Dorothy, a concern of the bid. Okay. So I'm saying that I would, of all the many choices, I would like to do the senior kitchen, and I would like to do, to get our community back on track, people working together, and where Dorothy. the Black business community feels that it has been heard. Thank you. Thank you. Shalini. And thank you. Um, I have a lot of points. I'm just going to make a couple and then I'll wait to hear and then come back. So my first point is around the youth empowerment. And I really believe that in the plan that's proposed, I like bringing in people from different committees. Um, but I also strongly feel that we should include the youth. There's no better way to empower them other than giving them that opportunity to lead this initiative and having spoken to a few youth member, you know, in high school, one of who was here today and, um, and spoke uh, and I said do they have do this would there be an interest and they he was like, absolutely there are many of us who are really passionate we would love to be on the task force and um, and I said would students have time and he said absolutely we have the time so I, I would really like to find a way to include them in this leadership aspect leadership role the second thing I was thinking of in terms of economic development was that our town one of the main businesses is investing in housing and we've heard in crc a lot of issues we've heard from affordable housing trust a lot of issues around affordable housing workforce housing and so could we use some of the funding to hire an economic development director with a focus on in uh, going and looking and inviting new uh, developers who are committed to these newer innovative kinds of um, housing developments like the one we saw from new hampshire we had a speaker uh, a developer who came who's doing these small tiny homes and so the idea of this economic development um, officer for 
two years could be to go and attract, to engage with the different stakeholders and find out where can we find these kind of developers who would in, do the kind of investment we'd like to see that supports workforce housing. This develop, uh, development officer could go and speak, engage with UMass, especially the BIPOC communities on campus to support them in launching their social and entrepreneurial innovations in Amherst. And lastly, uh, this uh, di director could be the person who is working with the local entrepreneurs, artists, and businesses uh, with a special focus on BIPOC communities to make sure, and then engaging with uh, the Black Businesses Association, uh, uh, you know, uh, connecting with the Dividend Association, the Asian communities, and really like trying to find out where are they needing support, what kind of support do they need, where are they feeling stuck. Um, so yeah, that's all for now, and then I'll come back after. Thank you, Andy. Yeah, I'll, uh, I'm going to speak of mostly the matter of principles. And princ I'm going to start with one that is that um, a number one principle is that we comply with the ARPA law regulations and other ARPA grant conditions. Um, in doing that, it, it's really important um, for the community as and for the council, I think, that we establish criteria. And... Uh, there may be an opportunity to come back and discuss criteria. Things that I think about very strongly are the purpose of ARPA was to address problems of the pandemic. And so how an organization or an individual or a business that was um, seeking funds uh, through any of our programs was affected by the pandemic and why this is uh, funding is necessary to correct that, I think, is one possible principle we should be considering very strongly. Um, in the first round, and this was touched on by a prior comment, uh, I think it was really important that we make sure uh, that the downtown and village centers uh, remain strong. Uh, property taxes are the greatest source of local revenue, and if we don't um, get um, good support from the business community in the downtown and village centers, it all falls on homeowners. And uh, I think that we all recognize that the problems that ensue from, from that. Uh, we've made great progress on that. We have a low, uh, lower vacancy rate than many communities, uh, but I do think it's worth uh, bearing in mind. Um, I think it's important that we not, um, fund anything that has an ongoing funding requirement to it. If it is something that is just general funding for an organization without relationship to a specific purpose or correction of the uh, pandemic, then uh, what happens after um, ARPA funds run out? So I think that that's very important for us to consider. Um, in the end, uh, the town manager needs to make the decision about the grants, and I think that it's important that um, that decision be grounded and explained based on the criteria. And the last thing, that, since I only have 30 seconds left to talk about, is infrastructure. Infrastructure is very much a part of the uh, ARPA grants, and uh, many communities have relied very strongly on ARPA funds to fund uh infrastructure purposes and um, for that reason um, i think it's really important that we consider it that can be the senior center this uh the solar canopy the high school roads and sidewalks Andy. there are a lot of things that it can be thank you uh, so thank you okay pam thank you um Dorothy did a nice job of, of summarizing my two priorities as well. Um, and I think uh, a case was made tonight, especially that we are looking to strengthen a broad base of businesses that don't necessarily sit um, in the front window, you know, at the corner of Main Street and um, helping build back and reestablish a strong base of of entrepreneurship in the community is is really key, especially if it helps uh, attract and maintain 
residents who otherwise would look to other communities to find a, a more comfortable home. Um, so I think, as Dorothy did say, uh, I think we can do a good job on round two. I, I did send in a written list already, but I wanted to reiterate those two. The senior center is imp imp very important because it serves such a wide, wide range of folks in the community as well. Thank you. Andy Joe. Thank you. Um, I, I start with um, that. I'm sorry, I think I just lost my computer by accident. Um, but I, I start with the fact that the ARPA money is set is supposed to um, help those individuals and areas where that were most affected by COVID. Um, and so I don't hear myself saying this very often, but I agree with Dorothy is with respect to the senior center. Seniors were some of the hardest hit individuals in COVID, um, both in outcomes and just loneliness in some sense. Um, and so money spent for a senior center seems directly in line with what the ARPA money is supposed to be doing. Um, with that, um, the, I agree with Andy on the requirements needing criteria. Um, I think we need specific criteria based in the federal reasons um, for ARPA uh, grant funds to determine where we should put the money. Um, beyond that, um, I have serious concerns. While I support solar canopy at the high school, I have serious concerns about how that works because the high school land is not our land. It is the region's land. And so I would be very hesitant to commit any money to a project that is on land we do not own um, and would generally be paid for with only 80% of our contribution and 20% coming from three other towns. Um, so before any of that money is committed, I'd love to be able to ensure that um, the other towns have some contribution or we have some ownership rights on the land or something. Um, I don't know how that would work, but I'd want that. Um, and lastly, I, I wanna go to housing. Housing and security um, during COVID was huge for those that are of low income. Um, they lost, a lot of them lost their jobs during COVID um, in the service sector and the rent, um, some, some of the uh, eviction um, protections are expiring and everything. And I think uh, something for ARPA um, should be to ensure housing stability or increase housing um, attainable and affordable housing for those at the lower income. And I think that would be really um, something right on point with what ARPA funds are meant to do. Thank you. Thank you. Michelle? Thank you. <clears throat> so I agree um, with some of the other counselors. I think all of the voices that we've heard tonight um, and via email are in need of and deserving of ARPA funds. And there are a lot of uh, competing and necessary demands um, and a, a decent chunk of, of money. So what I uh, think about um, while I'm listening to all of the possibilities and doing some research, um, into how other communities have uh, allocated their ARPA funds, it occurs to me that in any, where, where we receive as a municipality any federal or state funding, um, and when there is a community input process in place, that goes through an advisory committee. And so my question is why uh, are, you know, I think it's 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 generative for us to be throwing around ideas and listening to the voices of our community. But in terms of process, it seems to me that having an advisory board um, that would be appointed by the manager, um, just like with CDBG and CPA, um, just to give some context for CDBG. 
I think about 1.65 million uh, was given uh, for our use this year and CPA is about 2.7 million. We're talking about 4.9. So to me, that's worthy of, and, and a whole year that we have before this needs to be determined. So to me, that's worthy of putting together an advisory board, having an RFP process, um, with criteria in place that the advisory uh, board would use. Of course, using our equity lens, um, I think that this would be good to include education and awareness, translation, getting out into the community um, to make sure that that input uh, comes into the advisory board from all of the pockets of our community. So if I had it my way, that's what I would like to see is us put together, Paul put together an advisory board, a diverse um, set of individuals who would take proposals um, and look at them through an equity lens um, and then determine how the money should be allocated. Um, so that's where I think we have an opportunity to improve in this round. And uh, I think that's what many communities uh, are doing and, and very successfully so. Thank you. Jennifer. Thank you. Yes. And I, that's a terrific suggestion, Michelle. Please and, speak into yeah, the mic. I, um, you know, would su support, yeah. Um, following through, we're looking, you know, at Michelle's suggestion, I guess, you know, in round one, you know, we were kind of, you know, inventing the plane or whatever the saying is as we were flying it. Um, I think sometimes we have to remember where we were when all this started and we were in totally uncharted territory. But I do think um, as the um, emails came in, lots from letters from residents, I mean, there, there's nothing I wouldn't support. They were all the most, you know, worthy and needed, um, you know, uh, causes and organizations um, to support. But I think, I do think for our community to move forward, we do, if it's, you know, going through an advisory board, you know, have to make um, a portion of the ARPA funds available for the member businesses of the um, the Black Business Association of Amherst area, those that are in Amherst, and even other um, Black businesses that may not be part of the organization, that, that we have to do better in round two um, for the businesses and for our community. And then beyond that, I certainly, you know, if we're looking at uh, the ARPA funds that were intended to um, respond to communities that were um, experiencing harm and hardship during COVID, I think that, you know, organizations like our senior center, um, a youth center, um, Amherst um, Survival Center, Amherst Community Connections, that those organizations reach everybody. And I think it's important that they be helped to be able to reach, reach all, all um, members of our community that experienced hardship during COVID and continue to do so now. And, you know, and then beyond that, we receive requests from Amherst Media and even from Amherst Historical Society. I don't, um, and many, many, many residents expressed um, concern and they want to see us respond to roads and sidewalks. And where, you know, initially I thought, well, of all the requests, that one seemed to be, you know, there were different kind of wish lists, but that was on many. But I don't know that we have enough funds that we can really make an impact that way, where I think that we could, you know, um, giving funds to the businesses, to the senior center, to a youth center, to Amherst Survival Center, community connections, that we might, the 4.9 million, I don't know how much of an impact, as I think about it more, it would make on roads and sidewalks, although that is a top priority for all of us. So I put that out there where the funds distributed among organizations that are directly serving people that experience hardship as a, as a result of COVID, it might make a bigger impact. Thank you, Pam. Pat. Thank you. Um, I mean, wanna say first that I'm a regular volunteer at the Survival Center and I'm part of the Mobile Market Planning Group, uh, but I'm not speaking for either of those groups. Um, I just want to remind us, because I looked when, uh, at the town manager's report, and I was delighted to see that Craig's Doors Amherst Survival Center 
the Homelessness and Rehousing Working Group, LA Community Health Services, the uh, Housing Trust, and the Mobile Market, yay, and the Family Outreach of Amherst were all spoken to and input was gathered from. So I wanna share very briefly, cause there particularly some of what Jennifer said, but a little bit of everybody's, the federal final rule around ARPA funding. Um, that rule recognizes that certain populations have experienced disproportionate health or negative economic impacts during the pandemic as pre-existing disparities in these communities amplify the impacts of the pandemic. For example, the interim final rule recognized that the negative economic effects of the pandemic were particularly pronounced among lower income families who were more likely to experience income loss and more likely to have a job that required in-person work. The interim fi final rule recognized the role of pre-existing social vulnerabilities and disparities in driving the disparate health and economic outcomes, uh, et cetera. So, and presume that programs designed to address these health or economic disparities are responsive to the public health or negative economic impacts of the COVID-19 public health emergency when provided in disproportionately impacted communities. Spend a couple of hours sometime at the Survival Center and you will see an incredible cross section of this community. And it will break every um, assumption and limit that you place on who goes to the survival center. But that's true about community connections. It's true about everything. Um, and it's true about businesses, black businesses and other BIPOC businesses that have been and individuals. So it seems to me that we have to spend time in this round really looking at how do we help individuals as well as businesses. And I think that's critically important around housing, around health issues, et cetera, et cetera. Thank you. Alicia. Um, thank you, Lynn. So I think most counselors alluded to most of what I wanted to say, so I don't want to be too redundant, um, but I do want to emphasize a few things. I think Dorothy Pam said almost exactly what my, my emphasis would be. Um, and so thinking about what the ARPA funds are really for, and that's to mitigate the impacts of COVID and the impacts that they've had in our community and thinking about some of our most vulnerable populations who have, may have been more disproportionately impacted by COVID um, and seeing how we can reinvest in those communities. Um, one of those I would agree would be the seniors and the senior center. Uh, the other huge portion that I think we continuously overlook is our youth. Um, they are experiencing severe mental health crises. And I think we definitely ought to invest in an empowerment center or some type of services that can be directly distributed to the youth and that the youth may have some say in how they are cared for in that way. Um, also, low income residents. And so this is just going off of a little bit of what uh, Pat just said. Um, and while I support giving more monies to businesses and that we've had um, a rental assistance program that was distributed by a local business or a local nonprofit, I further support direct payments to residents and to not go through another organization. Um, and the reason I say this is because financial hardship doesn't present in one way. So just missing your rent is not the only way you can be experiencing a financial hardship. Some people have severe hard housing insecurities and they will scrape together every last penny to pay the rent, but then other bills are going unpaid. And so how can they get help for those other bills? And so putting restrictions and requirements on how people can use the money or how we expect people to be behind is really unrealistic. Um, and some of the requirements that we had on this round of monies, although it's great and I'm happy that a lot of the funds were distributed, you had to have an actual eviction notice to even be able to access the funds. And to me, that's unacceptable. People should be able to access the funds well before an eviction notice is received because that goes on your permanent housing record and prevents further housing opportunities. So thinking about really ensuring 
housing and the, longev the longevity of housing and other resources like car bills, electricity, heating, like there are so many other things, food insecurity, food stamps is not always enough. And um, I think Lev Benazro said really graciously during her public comment, COVID benefits are coming to an end. So people who received those benefits during the emergency are no longer receiving those benefits. And that does not mean that they no longer- Alicia, please wrap up. Um, yeah, so I would support direct payments to residents. And the last is for businesses. And again, my urge is that we look at the requirements and the application processes, because I think that that was one of the biggest challenges during the first round is we put unrealistic requirements and expectations on the businesses, on the peoples who are who are applying to receive these funding. So I ultimately support much more laxed requirements. You don't need to be paying taxes. You don't need to be Alicia. up to Please wrap for up. you to be able to or to be able to receive ARPA funding. And that has happened in plenty of other towns. So I know this to be true. Um, so again, I really are just to relook at the way in which we are dis dispersing the funds. Anika. Okay, I'm going to try to to get through. I think some of these we may get an explanation at a um, a later date. Um, I do not like to say I'm the only one because these things often get put in headlines and I do not claim to be, but I believe I sit here as the only black business on council. Uh, so that may be something that I may be most aligned with, but I wanted to address also, and I, and I do appreciate Michelle, I really appreciate your comments, um, but I wanted to know also just as taking into consideration uh, the requests that we have seen submitted by the community. Um, and some we know have been overwhelming. I've had overwhelming support. Um, you know, uh, Mindy Dom just mentioned about the water uh, treatment and that being a, a top priority. That's a public health issue. So um, I would like to hear more about that and see how that's being explored. As we know, water is life. Um, that is incredibly important. Um, you know, we do, we've had, we've heard a lot of the push about roads and sidewalks and where I do understand all of the opinions that come around that. Um, could we have a breakdown of, of if, what would that look like? Like what kind of impact would that happen if money goes to roads and sidewalks? How, how is that determined? Um, because I, I think that we know, I mean, we have people who are, you know, hurt, um, you know, and it's, it's a safety issue uh, for those who have mobility issues and, you know, also concerns of those who feel like, you know, hear our voice, especially in, in regards to uh, taxes that are paid. Um, I do also have, uh, want to uh, appreciate and support Senior Center. I just would like to make a comment that we are losing a gem this coming Friday, Donna Hancock. She's someone who has uh, run the, the lunch program. She was there every day uh, with our, our last uh, director, Mary Beth Ogilwitz. She has, I have personally witnessed her take from her own pockets to provide lunches for those who are hungry to sustain them either through the evening or through the weekend. Um, she, her heart and how she sees people that is invaluable and um, replaceable. And it's, you know, I, I spend a good amount of time there um, in, in the Banks Community Center um, around, um, you know, where the, the Civil War tablets are and just with those who are so lonely um, and hungry you know, and are limited in many ways. So I'm, I'm seeing that I'm over my time. I'll pause there. And if there's time, I'll come back with some additional comments. Okay. Are there counselors that have not spoken who would like to speak at this time? Kathy. I'll just, I'll, I'll be really brief. I think um, it's a mistake to think of 4.9 million as one big bucket. I think we need to carve out some place, if we want to carve out a community piece, carve it out and be really clear on what the criteria are, because these other kinds of needs, roads, sidewalks, uh, the senior center, um, require substantial investment. So trying to say, you know, what investment in upgrading the senior center versus helping Amherst Survival Center, I don't think we should try to make, we should just put them in a different bucket is the way I would do it. And I, 
I very much liked the original criteria that Sean and Paul gave us that it um, shouldn't be an ongoing expense. It should be in some way an investment of one time. And to the extent we can invest in something that lowers the cost to taxpayers, it'd be great. So if water treatment plant is out there as an issue, hitting people with another water rate increase or another sewer increase is something that would be nice to avoid. I don't know enough about that. So I just think we need to be really careful. And I tend to think about it as if these were our tax dollars, how would we spend them? We're not gonna get this gift again anytime soon. So we should be really careful with what are the unmet town needs um, that we've just queued up um, and sidewalks would be one of them. So I, I just think trying to divide, divide it up rather than thinking the, the whole piece is going through the same set of criteria, it, it could be different. That's it. Okay. Are there other counselors that have not spoken? I'm looking around and I don't see any except for me. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, thank you. Um, first of all, I want to thank the people who've spoken both tonight and also in the previous meeting, as well as the many, many people who have written to us on the emails. Uh, I, I accept responsibility for one of those floods because I sent it out to my constituents and Pam Rooney did the same. So she has to accept some responsibility for that too. Um, let me just say, I think the council has come forward with a couple of different really significant suggestions, including the advisory committee. And also the idea that there's different, different chunks of this money. And while I believe we should do something that continues to invest in our businesses, including our black and BIPOC businesses, I also have to say, and it's not going to come as a surprise, every dollar we can find for roads and sidewalks, we need to find. So I really don't want us to overlook that. I share some of the very same concerns Mandy Joe does about the solar on the high school parking lot. I'd love to see the project happen, but it's not our property. And so that concerns me. And I very definitely would like to see us make an improvement for our senior center because we're not going to be able to build a new senior center anytime in the near future. And we need to invest in reclaiming our senior center for our aging population and uh, help bring them back into the community that they were estranged from during COVID. That's also true for our youth. And so these are tough decisions. There's more good ideas out there than we could ever have possible money for. Um, and I wanna thank the town manager and Sean for putting out some initial ideas that stimulated a conversation that's begun, not finished, begun. And although it has included some very controversial um, thoughts and so forth, let's look at this as an opportunity to do this in a way that we have a renewed transparency uh, for all of the money that we spend. Um, with that, I'm going to ask if any other counselors feel as if they need to add anything else at this time. Anika. Yes, I would also like, I had requested uh, the last meeting that we will, that if we could have a clear breakdown if possible or as clear as possible as to what criteria is um, to receive ARPA funding. We have a lot of opinions out there. We're hearing a lot about appearances, but people cannot eat appearances and they will not be successful with appearances. You can't pay your rent with appearances. So I think that if we can have as much information so we're clear and not debating about what we think, what we've heard, what we've read, just as clear as possible about what exactly the criteria is that makes one eligible or not, and where is their flexibility. I think that that would be really helpful because going in circles again is not going to um, sustain anything. Okay, Michelle. I just want to quickly build on what Kathy was referring to. And again, if we look at um, the CDBG funds, 
Um, their RFP process is broken down into non-social service priorities and social service priorities. Um, so that might be a way for us to look at uh, the, the full pot. Um, the other thing I wanted to say is when I was listening to Waylon Greeny of the community, um, is it Community Connections? Yeah. I, it, it, she, she, they spoke of um, not re receiving um, funds in several different uh, applications that they, that they uh, submitted. And I just want to uplift something that Vera said in um, making sure that we are really looking at those that may have been left behind in the first round and really digging into that. Um, I, I really have no way of cross-referencing cross which uh, foundations or nonprofits or businesses received money in which buckets of money are available. Um, so it's important, I think, that that is, is a lens that we're using to really ensure that um, we are uh, using a fair and equitable process. Thank you. Alicia. Um, thank you. I just wanted to build a little bit off of Anika's ask, uh, because I would like the same information if it's available, but in two parts, like I would like to see the federal guidelines and requirements and what our town has made the guidelines and requirements, because those are two separate things. Um, and it would be really helpful to see those things, um, because I'm not sure if those were made available to us and for the prior round, but also for the next round coming up. So it would be helpful to see like when the town manager is getting ready to allocate these funds, like what the application process is, right? The, what the requirements are. Um, I also support having another review board of some sort, looking at the funds that is comprised of different peoples from the town. Um, and I would also highly support and recommend reopening ARPA funds to those who applied and did not receive it in the first round. Dorothy. I, I just want to say a good word for community connections. Um, Wayling is on the front line, one by one, working with the individual people who come with problems and helping get them on the road to um, being in control of their life. And her um, community connections also is a wonderful bridge with the university, uh, a place for the college students to do an internship and it's, it's, it just links so many different aspects of our community together. Um, the problem is we have heard so many wonderful needs today and we're not talking about that huge amount of money, but there are other funds coming up, other places. And um, let's just hope that this, this, the outpouring of comments from the public, that we remember them, including fixing Puffer's Pond. I mean, they're just so many good things. But I will say the song that everybody sang was roads, 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 and sidewalks. But this little piece of ARPA money isn't going to fix that. We have to find another way to deal with that. Um, so it's, it's a problem. It's a problem. And uh, I guess it's not ours. It's the town managers. So, you know, I wish you luck in making these decisions. Thank you. Okay. And that's um, Shalini. Yeah, I also want to just um, uh, like uh, highlight um, this, uh, the email that we received from um, uh, Wailing. And I think what stood out for me also is the idea, uh, the perception that she and maybe others have that what is the reason for them applying seven times and only receiving it twice? And is it are there inequities in that process? So, you know, either the, you know, like what is the criteria that's being used to award the CDBG funds? And then maybe is there a communication that happens after the awarding happens and who received it and what was the criteria or something that needs to be maybe improved upon so people are not left feeling um, that there are inequities in this process. Um, and also, was struggling with, I agreed with the, with the proposal that came to us from the town manager 
about you know the senior center i definitely definitely agree that we should support the kitchen upgrades over there and i personally would like to see the solar canopy um but then we heard from Amherst Cinema, uh, Amherst Cinema and Amherst Media and Puffer's Pond and all of these. So uh, I do appreciate Michelle's idea that, and maybe it can be, there are projects we've already identified like youth empowerment and all of those. So getting those started with the task force and so forth, but then for the remaining, maybe a small pool of money, if we have a, a, an advisory committee that can, I don't know, like, I'm, I, unless you have a, and, and it's it's in your court, of course, Paul, like, how are you going to prioritize? But in my mind, I was like, oh, my God, how am I going, how do I even prioritize? Like, what do I even offer as a recommendation? So uh, I would love to hear what you decide in terms of how you did end up prioritizing these different uh, needs and communicating that, you know, with the, with our community. Thank you. Paul, do you have any final comments you'd like to make before we move on? Sure. I mean, I think there have been some common themes that I've heard, and I think you know, we'll go back and, and really, I want to look through my notes. I've taken note, detailed notes on everything that everyone said tonight, the public speakers, as well as the counselors. I mean, I think I've heard what I've heard very overwhelmingly is the support for a youth empowerment center and a senior center. Um, I haven't heard a lot of support for the solar canopies there because there are a lot of questions that go with that. Um, even though I think everybody supports that, I just think haven't heard as much like that's a top priority for the council. And then I've also heard about the the value of an advisory committee, uh, the, the importance of transparency and the desire to have explicit criteria uh, uh, in advance of the decision. So everybody, as everybody's clear on the criteria, I do want to make a note that the CDBG decisions are made by an advisory committee. So even uh, they sometimes will not fund some things. Um, but so even if it's an advisory committee, it doesn't mean it's going to be a perfect decision in some people's eyes. But I think the process that an advisory committee brings is is important. So those are the major things, but I think I really want to sort of dwell on this and, and talk it through. And if you have other comments or thoughts, you know, after tonight, especially after listening to what the public had to say or what some of the correspondence that you have read, you, you received a lot of emails on this um, and, and you have a revelation, please send them along to us. Um, so over the next few weeks, we'll be talking this through and um, trying to figure it out. Thank you. Shalini. I'm, I'm sorry, I wasn't there the last. I'm sorry, I know, I know. This is the last thing. I just wasn't there the last meeting. So I just want to acknowledge all the comments that were made uh, by the members of the Black uh, Business um, Association and the points that were raised. And I think I just want, and then I also want to appreciate the work that was done by the town, by the bid. And and I think there, what what I'm hearing is that we can always continue to improve on, uh, which has already been said, but I just had to say it. And in terms of um, finding, continuing to improve our channels of communication, whatever we decide with, if you're going to continue to give grants for moving forward, uh, making sure that we increase the channels of communication, whether it's through the Black churches, to the BBA, the the Tibetan communities, all these different. So how can we engage and reach that? Um, and then I think the other thing is uh, in terms of the criteria, which I think Alicia was talking about, um, what are the criteria that are used to give these grants out? Um, again, assessing those, reassessing those and uh, supporting businesses at home. Um, the rent that Alicia was talking about the rental um stuff and all but i think all of this just to say that we we did the best that we did and there are a lot of people who did a lot and a lot of hard work to help the people in need and how can we moving forward continue to improve and um and listen to our community's needs thank you thank you um we are going to move on to the other discussion item. It's really not a long one uh, in your packet and attached to the town manager's report is the legal uh, review 
uh, that we requested regarded ranked choice voting. Uh, we mentioned last week that there is there has been another hearing, uh, and my testimony was attached to the president's report. Mandy Jo Haneke also testified at that, as did a Senator Comerford and Representative Dom. That committee has still not done its referrals out. Uh, but one of the things that you will find in the attorney's opinion and also in a separate conversation that I've had with Representative Dom, and that is we should seriously look at what East Hampton has done because they found a way to weave through this. Now, I'm not suggesting we debate that tonight. It's something that GOL could take up. It's also something that the Charter Review Commission could take up in the coming year. So if there, unless there's questions, uh, basically what the attorney has said is, we, yes, we had to file a special legislation. That is the only way we could do this at this time. Andy. Yeah, just a, one question. Um, the way that I uh, look at the statute that was the special legislation that was filed, uh, it only applies uh, to elections that are more than 120 days after enactment. And uh, so at this point, uh, we are not going to have ranked choice voting That's for the election in November. And I think that uh, if there's agreement to that, then at least we should acknowledge it as we uh, look at the process going forward. Uh, the, in fact, we were very clear when we filed the legislation, if it was not enacted by July 1st, it would not give us sufficient time to educate voters as well as prepare the uh, sec the uh, town clerk. So it will not be implemented for the fall election. Michelle? Can you just quickly summarize what you mean when you say what East Hampton did? East Hampton actually did get their ranked choice voting approved. And it was, some of it was how it was written in their charter and some of it was their timing with the legislature from everything I've been able to. I honestly haven't had time to spend a lot of time on that. And hopefully someone on the council might do that. Uh, it's just that every once in a while people recommend, reference that. And as I mentioned, both our attorney included as an attachment to the opinion, East Hampton's bylaw and in addition to that, Mindy has made several inquiries about it as well. So it's it's kind of an emerging conversation, okay? All right, then I'm gonna go on to action items. Uh, the authorization of Community Resources Committee to hold a public hearing on proposed amendments to bylaw 3.48 stretch energy code. Kathy, you asked to pull this from the consent agenda. And Mandy Joe, you were the one that asked that it be put on the agenda. So I would like to hear from both of you. But talk with us. Okay, <laughs> I, I'll, I'll tell you why I pulled it. Mandy and I had a quick discussion during the break. So I got some answers I didn't have before. Um, when, when this was brought up at the last meeting, um, well, I was on an effort, another continent and it was, 3.30 in the morning, so I wasn't completely following all the pieces. But um, this is, a, if we adopt this as a town, this is on top of a brand new state building code that will be taking place this year, increasing the cost of building um, statewide. Um, and so I think we need more information. So my concern is going out to public hearings before we are able to at least provide ask some questions and provide information. So what is the marginal impact on costs? Um, how will it affect older housing stock if the owner is going to renovate it? Do we have staff with the expertise to be able to assess and apply the stress code? What does it do to the grid? 
And does it put us at a competitive disadvantage with other communities if they don't adopt it? Who can, you can move a mile away and you can build the building, whether it's a house or an apartment building or a store. We're already really expensive. So I think we should pose those questions and at least begin to have some answers before we go to a public hearing. And Mandy can follow up now because she's going to assure me that we will be doing that. So well, I just saw a public hearing and I thought, but I don't have answers to any of these and I'm happy to send my two page list on to you. Please do. Mandy. Um, so give a little reason as to why this is on here. Uh, the last time, last council meeting when we referred it, I had seen in a DOER, um, Department of Energy Resources FAQ that a, a body adopting a, a city council adopting um, the specialized stretch codes needs to hold a public hearing. Well, our motion to refer did not have that authorization in there. We did get from KP law a com confirmation that a hearing needs held um, before the council could adopt that. Um, the motion to refer and what the referral that CRC now has is to make a recommendation on whether to adopt or not. Um, and so the KP law also said CRC could hold that hearing in the council stead. So I asked that Lynn put this on the agenda so that CRC can hold that hearing. The plan as it stands now um, is to, if this is referred for, for hearing, if CRC can hold the hearing, is to start on August, is it the 3rd, I think is our next meeting? Um, the first meeting in August 2nd, 7th, 7th, whatever the, no, the first CRC meeting in August, I think that's the 3rd or the 2nd. Um, it's the third. Whatever it is, the third, um, and get a list of questions that counselors want answered and provide that list to, um, Anna was the counselor sponsor to this, um, Jesse um, Selman was the lead from ECAC, provide it to them, provide it to our staff, and try and get all of those answers. I have been myself working on compiling information produced by DOER that will be in the the August 3rd packet, um, as well as presentations from the one community water town that has already adopted it mm -hmm. um, so that we can see what they were presented with when they made the decision and, and some of the information there. So I am already working at coming up with that information. If we, you know, and then the plan was to then on the 17th, hold the public hearing. It's sounding like we might not, that two week lag might not be enough. So we'll probably then hold the public hearing in September yeah. instead. But all of that additional information along with whatever's going in the August 3rd packet would be included in the packet for the public hearing um, so that we have, and the public has as much information about this as possible prior to holding the public hearing. Um, so that's the plan. I have also found DOER put out a sample bylaw. So I've forwarded that on to, um, Anna um, to work on to provide potential changes to the current bylaw that has adopted the stretch code to make sure we have the language. Um, KP Law and Athena said we need the language to hold the public hearing. Okay, Wait, Melanie. Then, I'm sorry, Kathy. Then I just want to follow up a little bit, um, and I will send this through. You know, I think too often we jump to regulation, and we're in a really unique place. A good place in the United States is IRA. This uh, Inflation Reduction Act has huge incentives, positive incentives for people to move towards solar. And so we could take some time to say, what happens if you have incentives and you have what the state is already putting on the books and how fast do things move um, rather than um, go to regulation right away? So that's that's one of my questions. It's not answerable, but it's for people to think about because we, we've got an experiment going on that my son said Europe is looking at because we're moving faster than they are and they've gone the regulatory. IRA made a huge difference, particularly in food supply, fertilizer and farming. So just trying to think that how do these interact? So these are the questions, Mandy, I just didn't wanna to rush to the public hearing and wanted to get these kinds of issues posed so the public doesn't have to supply us with the information, they can react and then interact. Thanks. Shalini. Yeah, I, I was wondering if the public hearing could also be an opportunity for education and if ECAC could come and make a little presentation on why this is important. 
um, and I, you know, I, even what we're doing with the waste hauler bylaw, like part of this change is only possible when we all buy into it and we buy into it when we see how, why this is needed. Um, so I think that would be really helpful to see that. And the other thing is, is something along the lines of what Kathy is saying, but it, but what I also heard, it's a yes or no, there's no path. Like I was almost thinking like, is there a, a roadmap to rather than just overnight changing it, is there a way to get to that place in terms of building a capacity, whether it's the technology, the staff. And so is there a roadmap to get to that end goal or is this something we need to do overnight change to that? Andy. Yeah, this may be a question for Mandy when she speaks, and it's very simple. I'm assuming that unlike zoning, that there's no requirement that the council act within a certain number of days following hearing. And uh, but if, uh, we, we should know the answer to that. So Andy the KP Joe. law opinion did not indicate any time frames on it. Just that a council had to hold. Um, a public hearing prior to the change taking effect. Um, so that means before we vote. <laughs> so there's no timeline unlike zoning where the hearing closes and you have to vote within a certain amount of time from what I've been told um, in the legal opinion that was sent through. To answer Shalini's other question about ECAC presentation, I have been in direct contact with both Anna and Jesse about availability. If we switch the planned hearing date, I will recontact them to make sure they are available for the planned hearing date. They will give a mini presentation on August 3rd in pre you know, before questions so that we get a little bit, but their most extensive presentation will be at the public hearing. Um, so, Mandy Joe, that would be not unlike when we do the public forum on the master plan. We always kind of have a little education period about the master plan first, and then we actually do the forum. Okay. Any other questions at this time? I need to ask for a vote. I'll make uh, the motion. Please go ahead. Um, move to authorize the Community Resources Committee to hold a public hearing on behalf of the Town Council on proposed amendments to bylaw 3.48, stretch energy code, for the purpose of considering adoption of the specialized energy code. Is there a second? Second, DeAngelis. Okay. Motion's been made and second. Are there any other questions or comments? Michelle. Is there a time, or this is just when it's deemed appropriate to do so? Okay. Okay. Uh, if I answer further, the prior referral had a date to return to the council by, um, I think it was 90 days. 90 days. Yeah. Although, as always <laughs> in that case, it means like we like back. to at least hear from you with an update. And it may not mean that we're ready to make a decision by then. Okay. Uh, I'm going to move to the vote then. Uh, Anna Devlin Gothier is absent and Grace Merzen. Aye. Mandy Johanneke. Aye. Anika Lopes. Aye. Michelle Miller. Aye. Uh, Dorothy Pam. Yes. Pam Rooney. Yes. Kathy Shane. Yes. Andy Steinberg. Aye. Jennifer Taub. Yes. Alicia Walker. Yes. Uh, Shalini Balmil. Yes. Um, Pat DeAngelis. Aye. It's unanimous with 12 counselors voting in favor and one counselor absent. We have already voted B, which is the uh, conservation restriction. Uh, C was withdrawn. D was voted. I'm just making sure I get everything. So we are now to, up to E. And um, this is the acquisition of a permanent utility easement parcel of land located off Old Farm Road, and I believe it is coupled with F. And uh, David Zomak is in the audience. If people have questions along with Guilford Mooring, I think uh, Guilford is really more your item, isn't it? So there was a memo, extensive memo in your packet. It included a map, but Guilford, do you want to give us the, you know, 
sentence, the couple quick version of the summary? Um, I guess there's really no quick one, but I'll try to be fast. <laughs> uh, we do have an iron uh, iron flock, iron oxide issue in the drain line here. And what we've done is we've partnered with a company that was a spinoff at UMass. They have a pilot technology or they have a technology and we're going to pilot at this site to try to remove the iron manganese out of the water so that we can release the water differently than what we're doing now. This is a totally a pilot. If it works, we have a lot more things to do. If we don't work, uh, if it doesn't work, we're done. But what you're, you have is a two things. One is a lease. Um, we're leasing a piece of roof from the neighborhood to put a solar panels on. And then we're leasing a, a site to run the solar power, the power from the solar panels all the way to the easement. The easement is actually on an existing drainage structure that we own. And we just need a little bit bigger area so we can install the mechanism which is going into the manhole to treat the water. So I think I've confused everybody, but that's it. Um, the, the lease is for the play, lease is to put the solar panels on the roof and to run the power line to the easement. And the easement is just to install the device over the sewer the stand, storm drain. Okay. It's getting late. Um, I don't know how you guys do this. Actually, I thank you for your very detailed memo. Uh, Mandy Jo. Yeah, mine's just a clarification question. In the motion and on page three of the very detailed memo, it says that the easement area is approximately 518 square feet. But the very next page on page four of the memo that includes the grant of easements, the first paragraph says that the easement area is approximately 225 square feet. Um, so I'm curious why there's a discrepancy and which one's the actual number that we should be moving in two, the motion two, sheet. 225 is the actual number. It was reduced down and uh, I don't think Sharon actually saw the reduction before she drew the documents up. So we only need 225 for the easement. Okay. The drawing, the, the actual survey is correct. It says 225. Mandy Joe, thank you. I know you asked that in advance of the meeting and I don't know that we got back to you. So uh, with that, was there any other question, Mandy Joe? Okay. Uh, the motion is to authorize the town manager to acquire and accept on behalf of the town of Amherst, a permanent utility easement in, on, under, over, along and across a parcel of land located on off Old Farm Road which parcel is identified by the assessors as parcel 18C-1-1 and described in a deed recorded with Hampshire Registry of Deeds in book 11437, page 292, and which easement area is shown as easement C area plus and minus equal to plus and minus 225 square feet on a plan entitled easement plan for the town of Amherst, Massachusetts, dated January 20th, 2023, prepared by Chappelle Engineering Associates Incorporated on file with the town clerk. Is there a second? Second, Mandy. Okay. Is there any other question on the first of these two motions? Yes, Pam. Is there an actual cost to the acquisition? There is a there is no cost to the acquisition. There has been a small amount that we've paid um, for the project, and we the most of the project is being funded through a grant that Beth Wilson worked out with the state and the um, company we're working with. But there is no cost for the acquisition. Okay. And so the motion has been made and seconded. We're going to move to a vote. Uh, Mandy Jo Haneke. Aye. Anika Lopes. Aye. Michelle Miller. Aye. Uh, Pam, Dorothy Pam. Yes. Pam Rooney. Yes. Kathy Shane. Yes. Andy Steinberg. Aye. Jennifer Taub. Yes. Leisha Walker. Yes. Shalini Balmilne. Yes. Pat DeAngelis. Aye. Anna's absent and Lynn Griesmer and I, and that is unanimous. 12 counselors in favor, one counselor absent. The second, which is building right on this and was 
of, regarding the solar is to authorize the town manager to enter into and execute a lease agreement with Ice Pond Woods Condominium Association pursuant to which the town will, for nominal consideration, install and maintain solar panels and related equipment within portions of the premises located at 87 to 88 Crossbrook Amherst for a term of up to 15 years and any and all notices of leases, easements, and other documents related thereto. Is there a second? Anarchy seconds. Is there I'm sorry? Oh, okay. I see. Uh, if you're in the room, just belt it out, you know? <laughs> right. Um, okay. Uh, motion's been made and seconded. Are there any other questions? Okay. With that, we're going to move to the vote. Anika Lopes. Aye. Michelle Miller. Aye. Dorothy Pam. Yes. Pam Rooney. Yes. Kathy Shane. Yes. Andy Steinberg. Aye. Jennifer Taub. Yes. Leisha Walker. Yes. Shelly Paul Milne. Yes. Pat DeAngelis. Aye. Griesmer is an aye. Mandy Johanneke. Aye. It's unanimous with 12 in favor and one absent. We're going to now move to G, which is the acquisition of permanent public way easement, 75 East Pleasant Street. Uh, Paul or Guilford, do you want to speak to this quickly? So this is basically cleaning up something that didn't get done in time. The select board, the town meeting approved the select board to take this back when we were doing the roundabout project at East Pleasant Triangle. Um, it was actually documented. All Everything was signed. It just didn't get recorded in time. So because it wasn't recorded in time, it actually doesn't exist. So now we're just redoing it so we can get it recorded in time and make it exist. But Bank of America donated the piece of property in yellow, that little highlighted section which was part of the roundabout. It's a little piece of roadway and it mostly contains the sidewalk which goes around the roundabout. Um, so you're voting to take this again and hope, yes, we will get it recorded in time and we won't have to do this again. Are there any questions or comments? I'm gonna read the motion to take on behalf of the town, a permanent easement for all purposes for which public ways are used in the town of Amherst at 75 East Pleasant Street as shown in the order taking order of taking on pages 11 to 15 of the motion sheet and to authorize the town council president to sign the order of taking on behalf of the town council. Is there a second? She got it done. Uh, Mandy Jo, you have a question. Yeah, um, with this voted in 2016 by town, count, town meeting and completed five, six years ago or so. Could you explain why it wasn't recorded in time such that we have to redo the vote and haven't been potentially legally using the property for this number of years? Um, it just it, it just didn't get recorded. It got stuck in a pile after it was signed and it wasn't picked up and taken to the registry and recorded. It's just one of those kind of oddball things that slipped through the cracks. Any other questions or comments? Uh, then we're going to begin with the vote. This time who, we go who to Who was Michelle the second Miller. then? Oh, it was Pam, Pam Rooney. Thank you. Absolutely. Um, Michelle Miller. Hi. Dorothy Pam. Yes. Pam Rooney. Yes. Kathy Shane. Yes. Andy Steinberg. Hi. Jennifer Taub. Yes. Leisha Walker. Yes. Shelly Bellmilne? Yes. Patty Angelis? Aye. Lynn Griesmers and I, Mandy Johanneke? Aye. Anika Lopes? Aye. Unanimous with 12 vote counselors voting in favor and one absent. Um, we. Thank you very much. Good night. I'm sorry? Thank you very much. Good night. Good night. Thank you, Guilford. Uh, Transportation and Parking Commission proposal. Paul. Um, Thank you, Lynn. So um, I'm, this is a different kind of uh, request to the council. 
we often are looking a big portion of the council's time is spent on public ways um, requests um, and concerns about handling uh, resident requests and one of the things that we had talked about is we have this transportation advisory committee which is sort of trying to figure out its role with the council and i included the charge from the transportation advisory committee um, a couple of years ago they started talking about the purpose of their charge what is their role um, do they just respond to things that the council has recommended to that has asked them to comment on can they take initiative things like that i've had several conversations with tracy zafian uh, I began, we, she, we both independently began looking at how do other cities handle traf, uh, transportation and parking issues. And what many of them do is have a separate commission that is set up um, and, and they, each one takes a different form, it seems, uh, to handle these things and actual, actually has decision-making authority. So the request to the council is to, is to have the conversation amongst yourselves as to whether you want to delegate some substantial portion of your authority as keeper of the public way to an independent body that would make the decisions in your stead. You could hold back some responsibilities, say, I'm not sure which ones you would, um, but there may be some that you think, oh no, I, we want to retain this from the council, this type of thing should come. But if it's a, for instance, a utility poll hearing or uh, somebody, want, uh, one of the uh, utility companies wants to install a poll, is that something you wanna spend council time on or is it something that you want to spend um, you know, have an independent body address it. Under the town charter, uh, the charter commission had established a licensing commission to do the same thing, but for liquor licenses and other license authority. And our experience with that is that has been very successful um, and very well run, uh, very efficient. And that's a, that's a authority that had uh, could have been given to the council, but was they were chosen? It was chosen to give it to this separate commission. So I have given you some background information, um, give you some uh, um, some logic on what we could do. Um, late today, I, we, I hadn't finished the spreadsheet that shows how all the other cities um, have approached this. I've got about five more to add, but I sent that out late this afternoon. Um, we'll be updating that for your consideration and it has links on it so you can look at what every other city uh, in the commonwealth ha how ha they handle um, uh, road and you know transportation issues we are doing this partially because of frustration that residents have had and trying to figure out who do we address our concerns about roads or if we want a road paved or if we want um you know, a, a road made one way, a, a sidewalk to be considered. Um, and the, I think the, there's been a lot of frustration with our residents about where does this go? And so we, some people are going to the resident, to the um, capital request process. Uh, they're coming to council goals. And it's just sort of like, it, I think we needed to provide, provide clarity to, to the residents. Um, the advantage of this is that we would have one body that would be looking at all the requests uh, on a townwide comprehensive approach. Um, I believe that there will be uh, additional clarity and transparency in the process. I think that there will be efficiency in terms of, you know, residents will know it goes to this committee and here's the process that we would establish. And I think that also would lead to better planning because we will have people who are dedicating their time just to transportation um, anything to do with the roads, whatever you decide to delegate to it. So um, my request to the council is that it use, you consider this if you um, think that it might be a good idea and, and have it refer to the GOL committee to start having that conversation. Um, I also wanna just connect a dot here and that is that at one point, uh, because of the various proposals that came to CD, no, to JCPC this year, and also then came to light with the discussion regarding Cushman School, the, instead of putting coming up with a response to those specific kinds of things, Paul instead came forward with this as a way of looking at comprehensive things. This is the opportunity to ask lots of questions and we're gonna start with Pam Rooney. 
Thank you. Um, I wonder why GOL would look at this rather than town services. It seems like town services gets into the nuts and bolts of road conditions and improvements. Why, why the suggestion for GOL? Um, I recommended GOL because that's the committee that looks at, at our operations of the town and the sort of structure. You can refer to either committee, both committees. It's really, I think it's better to be in one committee, at least initially, um, but it, you can refer to whichever committee you think is valuable. Shalini. Yeah, as a member of the town services and outreach committee, I just want to speak in complete support of this recommendation. Uh, whenever we've received, um, I know, like, I think this is a way to channel the expertise that is in our town as it pertains to, you know, um, the road safety and transportation needs and all of that. And it really uh, gives the people who are investing the time in the research and the study and proposing these, uh, making these proposals, giving them the authority to then act on it or to be, um, it to me it just makes a, a lot of sense to do that. So I just, I'm happy to answer any other questions that we have experienced in town services and outreach with respect to these issues, but just at the outset, I would highly recommend that we go forward with this. Mandy Jo. So I don't think I'm gonna be voting to request this um, or to continue looking at this, um, but I do have some questions in case it does get, the, the motion is to request the manager develop a draft charge um, and then that draft charge go to the GOL. And I'm not sure I want that to happen, but, um, it sounds like, although you didn't propose right now, that you're proposing potentially of stripping the council of its entire authority on the public ways because you said almost, well, you could retain some, but I'm not sure why you would want to. So I would like more clarification on if that is what you're thinking and in, would include in your draft charge. Um, I thank you for the spreadsheet, but it would be really helpful to delineate on that spreadsheet what the charter dictates for each city um, because our charter dictates that it's the council. And I'm curious whether there are any cities where the charter dictates it's the council if they have delegated their entire authority to someone other than the council. Um, I'm concerned that there's a push to remove the council's role in government as a whole, um, particularly with this, um, but we have heard concerns from prior councillors or some councillors that councillors shouldn't be proposing legislation and now we've got a proposal that says the council shouldn't be dealing with anything related to its roles as the keeper of the public way. And that really concerns me that we're trying to stop the council from doing what the council has been elected to do. Um, no specific instances were given in this recommendation um, that the council hasn't done its due diligence when deciding public way matters, only that it takes the time of the council. Yet we just finished a motion where seven years ago, town meeting authorized the taking of the matter and it had to come back to the council and take time at the council to redo something. That also takes time when things the council authorizers and town meeting authorized are not done in a timely manner. Um, I guess part of this is a frustration that the lack of clarity on how to do this simply means we strip the council of the authority and send it to someone else instead of proposing how the council can be more clear on exercising its authority. Um, and then finally, if this goes this way and we go this way, we'd have to change some bylaws because the bylaws say the council has to hold a public hearing on any parking changes and parking regulation changes, yet that wasn't part of your memo. Um, and so I worry that this is not well thought out, um, but I'm particularly concerned with the, the potential stripping of council authority um, when it is permanent changes to public ways, which is much different than the Board of License Commissioners. Um, and that was one of the reasons the Charter Commission felt that the public ways needed to remain with an elected body. Jennifer? Well, Mandy said it doesn't often happen that she agrees with Dorothy. <laughs> I guess I could say the same thing because that was kind of my reaction reading this. Um, and my concern was that it was delegating 
a major responsibility of the council to something. And I think the comparison with the Board of License Commissioners was we really never hear from them. So that maybe it was just not the, <laughs> the best example, but I thought, well, what kind of decisions are going to get made that will be, we'll find out after the decisions are made. So um, I had actually made a list of some of my concerns. Um, I felt a little better when I saw the chart because some of the cities and towns have counselors represented, mm -hmm. which I would definitely want to see on such a commission. But um, I was, yeah, so I mentioned a couple of things that just I was concerned that it just took too much away. And then um, I was also concerned. So with like the Cushman Scott um, Childhood Center, that if this co commission's purview is pretty macro, when you have a neighborhood or a district concern, is, is that where, are they gonna address something kind of that micro? Um, and I think there's a big, there's just so much um, expanse between, you know, electric poles, which I don't mind a commission addressing, and then really all parking and transportation. And I even wondered with something like a parking garage downtown, I mean, the zoning already allows for it. So would the commission decide we're going to do that? And then the council will be informed. So I have more concerns than not, but um, I would, you know, be open to discussing, to discussing it further. Kathy? I guess we're building on similar themes here. So um, I'll just provide an example um, that during JCPC, we had some neighborhoods and there have been others were asking for a speed hump or something that would slow traffic where there are through street where you can avoid an intersection by just cutting through the streets. So Cottage Street would be one where it's already happened. And the issue we ran into there is we didn't have a policy that looked at how many places in town are like this? Where are the priorities? How would we make a decision? So the problem was we didn't have a way to make a decision. It wasn't that we needed another body. We needed someone to sit down and figure out a way to make that decision because otherwise they came to us, they went to TAC, they went to DPW, they came to us. You know, it was because everyone said, well, we need a, a, a roadmap on, in a weird way. I mean, Pam said, let's look at how many places that are like this in town and what would we do? So, so I think punting it to a group doesn't um, get rid of the need for some clarity. And I'm also, one of the issues with DPW and TAC, what TAC with DPW is that TAC can come up with policy and think through things. And then they feel like they have no authority over DPW at all. And, and they may, it may go ahead and not do the top priority or any of the priorities. So there's a, a lack of who, who's in charge here. Um, so I just think those are questions, Paul, that are raised here. And I'd like to know how some of these other committees in other towns actually work, which issues come to them. And lastly, the license commission has in licensure, there's already on the books, like how many liquor licenses, how many this can there be? They've got a set of guidelines and then they're parsing along the edges of it rather than saying, should we have any liquor in town? Should we be a dry town? They don't have to tackle that. That's already been set up. The problem here is we don't have whether the Cushman intersections are great when should there be a stop sign there? Should there be a blinking light? And they just keep begging somebody to make a decision about this. And we already brought the police and everyone in. So I think we need to know a little bit more, a lot more about how other towns, what they have given over to it and to what extent some of the big issues still are residing in the council. Michelle? I still have to wrap my head around this a bit, Paul, but um, I, I generally like uh, this concept. I um, am wondering, so reading the third paragraph under the background is what really is resonating with me. Um, I think that close attention to technical and engineering questions and all of that is, is really important. So my question is, 
would this committee be um, a reporting committee to the council or would it have full authority? Like it, I think in Chelsea and Framingham, it looks like the commission's report to the town council. Um, is that what you're suggesting or are you suggesting that the commission would have the full authority without involvement of the council at all? So um, I think that my recommendation is that you give it the authority that you want to give it. Like you, you may retain some authority, say changing the direction of a street, whatever it is you want to retain, but you, you've delegated some responsibility to the town manager already. Um, for certain smaller things, which is great. And that, that facilitates what requests for parking or things like that. And that's, that works out pretty well. Um, but then we've stumbled in other areas, like this, we continue to use Cushman. Um, uh, and I think that, I think that a body like this could grapple with that in a more uh, interactive way than a formal council meeting would be able to. Um, and so, I, and I think it's it's one hundred percent up to the council to decide if they a if you want to do this, b if you if you want to, what authority you want to give it, this this group, uh, and see if you don't want to. But I think if we don't, then we need to clarify the role of of TAC because I think that's that's where TAC is sort of struggling. They they do all kinds of hard work, and they're sort of saying where where do we give our who do we give our work to and what what do we do with this and are they taking direction and early on when the council was first created um you know there's there's some question about what the role of tech was um in, in this process because it when it was, it was created under the it was advisory to the select board and to the town manager at that time um so i think it's at the very least we need to clarify that charge um but it's an opportunity to clarify the decision making process for many of these things that sort of get jumbled up Andy. Yeah, I, I was uh, made the proposal to talk about this because I didn't think we were being asked to commit to adopt anything that was proposed. But I do think we need to recognize that the current system is not working well, uh, close to broken. That there are a lot of times that things are referred to TSO they either take a tremendous amount of TSO time, such as the uh, parking issues around Kendrick Park, uh, or that uh, never get addressed, um, such as uh, the sidewalks along North Pleasant Street, along the university, uh, which has been referred, was referred to TSO in the last days of the last council and still hasn't been heard or discussed. Um, so I really um, feel like uh, we have a broken system and what we need is a process to talk about what the options are to fix that broken system. And uh, that doesn't mean that the council has to give up all of its authority necessarily, but we do need to do something and this is a way to at least start that process rolling. Uh, you know, it, does, it, it, is, it didn't work great under the select board. Uh, and, uh, you know, we tried, we used tact as best we could. Uh, and I don't think that it's been any better under the council. If anything, it's been more difficult under the council because I think that we've had so much on our plate and have taken on so many different kinds of issues. And uh, I think that the analogy to the, uh, uh, license Commission, which was a decision of the Charter Commission, uh, is actually a, a good parallel because um, the select board spent a tremendous amount of time on very difficult and unpleasant discussions. And uh, I think we should be uh, forever thankful that we don't have that responsibility uh, and uh, not have, uh, I mean, to, to have the discussion for the fourth time about uh, uh, Pan the East, for example. Uh, I just uh, think we should be thankful we don't have that. Uh, so um, I, I do think we should have a process to um, get underway and think about 
what's wrong with the current system and what are the options for fixing it. Uh, Pam, you only had a very brief question to start, so I am going to go back to you and then on to Dorothy. I, my brief question is, is that <laughs> um, I think it's, I appreciate that, that we develop some policies and, and priorities for roads, sidewalks, parking, upgrades in town. I want to ask the question if, if we need to take a vote tonight to, to direct it specifically at a, at a charge for this commission, or can we send this back to the town manager to say, can you just give us a little bit more information here? What are some other opportunities for um, us to consider um, I, rather than all in one fell swoop, a new commission? Um, as Andy said, a process is desperately needed, um, but I would like to hear some suggestions on, on, on different options. Um, and I wouldn't, and I would, I would be open to having a body that actually makes recommendations to the council. I, I can see so clearly that TAC is sort of, you know, master of none, you know, it doesn't know who to answer to. Doesn't, does it answer to you? Does it answer to DPW chief? Does it answer to TSO? And I think all of that really needs to be clarified because I would, I would like very much to have an, a group that whose responsibility it is to look at the town comprehensively and holistically look at safety areas, issues, um, upgrade requirements, and and come forward with, you know, in, in essence, an upgrade plan. And I would love to see that. So I, I thank you. Mm -hmm. Dorothy. Uh, I certainly can see the appeal of a group of people who are looking uh, at the overall picture in a disinterested professional way and giving us the benefit of their advice. But some issues are very political and that's us. We are elected by the people, we represent the people. And when it comes to something like a parking garage, I am not willing to give that away to a commission, um, no matter who's on it. Um, and the people are used to expressing themselves to us through the town council, through mail, through meetings, through public comment. So um, I think this is an idea that can be discussed further. Um, I like the phrase that uh, Pam Rooney just used, um, make recommendations. Um, but the question of exactly where the power resides at which times is an important one. And I think more work needs to be done. Thank you. Melanie. Um my understanding is that it's the idea is to vote to pass it on to a committee that is going to uh, discuss these issue who is you know what is the charge and they seem they could be a very clear separation that the policy making is still with the council but there are a lot of safety issues that we we hear from residents and then we, you know, it's not the town council's job to do that. It's more the town manager's job and there's no one really, we're listening to it and then we pass it on, but we're not really doing anything with it. And so in terms of town safety or so many other issues that could be looked at by a committee that has the expertise. So I think this is where I would also love feedback from the TAC, like what are some issues they see that they would like to take on ownership on and uh, all of these discussions uh, can happen in that committee that is going to have that discussion and then we can decide what you know what part what what we want to agree with or not and the other thing is like there's so much flexibility in who are they reporting to as well so I think there's just so many pieces that can be discussed and fleshed out and that need to be fleshed out but I like that we are having this conversation and um, this recommendation that there be a transportation, um, what is it, commission? Transportation Advisory Commission, what is it? Transportation- And parking. What do I call it? And parking commission, okay. Jennifer? Um, I, wait, hold on one second. Uh, Anika, Anika you haven't spoken yet. 
Um, yeah, so my comments have been covered um, majority by Mandy and Jennifer and pretty much everyone who's who's spoken already. Um, but with that, I did want to really, you know, acknowledge um, TAC and especially Tracy Zafin, who was pretty much an honorary member of, of uh, TSO and great help. And I do um, agree that, you know, in, in clarifying the charge and um, and I and I do support um, handing additional responsibilities, but my eyes start to twitch sometimes when we say recommendation and just making sure recommendations and making sure that we're clear. Um, you know, because we have seen um, we have we have seen issues with recommendations and what are they and clearly defining them. You know, um, what are recommendations? What are directives? And um, and then I you know also I you know support engaging in in TAC and seeing if there are specifics and what what would they like to handle or see being most um, helpful because I do see that there are plenty of, of issues and time that we simply cannot get to and are not on the streets with the people in the way that I'm sure we would all love to be but just cannot. Uh, Jennifer. Yeah, so I did have a question because it sounded like um, in your memo you had said that you would, would we refer to GOL, but you would come back with, you know, a, um, a more maybe, you know, um, a proposal based on some of the feedback you've got from our conversation. So maybe before we should get that before we make the decision whether to pass it on to a committee. Yeah, I think the actual motion is that you instruct me to put something together a little more thought. I, I didn't even know if you wanted to talk about this. And it sounds like a lot of folks don't and some folks do. So that's why I need clarification. I don't want to put time and effort into a pretty detailed, engaged process with our, you know, the staff and with the Transportation Advisory Committee. If the council is just not interested in it, if you're if you're like, no, nah, we're we're sort of we want we want to go a different path, that that would that would be helpful for me to know. So yeah, well, I think we we do feel that we need some expertise and they're probably like, again, the electrical poles and mm -hmm. maybe a, a little more involved than that, that we would be happy to have off our plate. But I, at least for myself, would not want something as removed from the council as the board of licensed commissioners. That just, um, and I'm more comfortable with a, you know, a commission board panel of experts that would, report to the council. But um, yeah, so I just wanted to ask for that, that we don't need to vote now to refer to a committee, no. but you'll come back with something. Thank you. Mandy Joe. So in listening to the comments, um, I'm trying to figure out how we could modify this motion to sort of take in the comments. But what I've heard from counselors is we need a process. Um, that process may or may not be appropriate to include TSO in because of potential time issues, but we need expertise. We appreciate the expertise of the TAC, um, but that the council at this point is hesitant to delegate um, permanent changes to the public way to anyone but us, but we would probably love some advice and recommendations related to those permanent changes. Um, so I think some sort of motion that asks the manager to come back with a process um, that sort of, you know, allows for that advising of the permanent changes, but also potentially changes our al already existing policy regarding public ways to delegate even more to a certain body or something, because we've delegated stuff to the Board of License Commissioners within that policy, um, and that the may maybe the manager can come back with that sort of actual draft in hand with specifics as to what would be delegated or what would just be what that body would advise the council on prior to the council acting. So Jennifer, go ahead. Paul. So I, I think one of the things that I've been thinking about is not creating another layer of where people go to a, a committee, they make the appeal and then they say, we're going to make a recommendation to the council. And then there are all those people have to then come to the council and have the exact same conversation. So that's why I was trying to place decision making authority with the committee so there isn't this two step process. If there are things that you don't want to delegate that's 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 good, but I, I just 
I'm trying to think from the public's point of view, they mobilize their 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 neighborhood to get something. They go to the transportation or whatever, the advisory committee, then they say yes, no, whatever. And then they again mobilize. It just seems like a yeah, just looking for the efficiency of the decision making process. That's why that's why I was thinking of it this way. And maybe that's not something you want to do, but that's how I was conceiving of it. I'm getting the sense that perhaps the council is not ready to vote on this, that they might want to see a little more in-depth thought about what might happen or not happen, what would get referred, what would come back to the council. So unless somebody wants to make the motion that's on the sheet or a modified motion, I'm going to suggest that town manager come back with additional information. Pam. I was told once by the town manager that he really doesn't take any action unless it's been motioned and voted on. So I just want to make sure that he's comfortable with us asking him to do something without an action and a vote. Well, I was going to ask, what do you want back <laughs> in addition? Like what would be more specific about when you said more detailed, that doesn't help me well, a lot. Let me build up on where I think Mandy Joe and several other people have gone. And that is, are we delegating everything? Are we asking for delegating some things, but asking for recommendations on others? And I think that's where the crux of this is. Mm -hmm. That's. So, and, and, and I I'm would hearing, say, since you found those other. Can we go in order? Kathy. Yeah, go, Kathy, go ahead. And since you found other towns, we might have some glimmer that they've delegated everything, they've de delegated pieces, just some example, something more concrete than, right. than other towns do something. Right. Let me go back to the people with the raised hands. Michelle? From my perspective, um, Paul provided to us in pretty good detail um, the proposal that he's making and the reason he's making it. And what I'm hearing is that he's looking to us to come up with some ideas about a process and about how we might view what could or could not be or should or should not be delegated. Um, I'm sort of taking, I think, what Dorothy said about certain aspects of this being political, picking up on maybe Jennifer talking about the parking. And so I'm, I'm wondering if this is a discussion that the council needs to have. Um, I can't imagine what Paul could bring back to us that would move this along. I think he's given us what we need to put it into a committee and have a discussion happen and then have that be brought back to the council with some options about how we might pursue it or not. Shalini? Yeah, I'm wondering if it's better to send this proposal to the town services and outreach committee because we are the one that deals a lot with these issues and we drop on the expertise of the transportation advisory committee often and it has crossed my mind you know, like we're in the lack of communication with them or like it's breaking down or it's there's no formal process here. So it's often crossed my mind that I, we really value the Transportation Advisory Committee and we deal with these issues. So to me, it makes sense that if the TAC could provide their input and then Paul could provide a little more clarity in terms of, at least for some of us, that these are policy issues and these are the more executive sort of issues that the TAC could take on and uh, or maybe there might be some policy issues not like political ones but some other ones that uh, so just getting a little more clarity around what are the the, the, dis, the division between these different types of um, requests we're getting from the residents and I think the TSO would be a good committee to tackle this. Paul, you had your hand up and took it down. Um, yes, I'll take it down again. Um, so I think that that's, I think the council needs an actual concrete proposal to refer and to respond to. And I think that's one of the things that Athena's really sort of emphasized in, in the lead up to this is that you can't just say, hell, it would be not very efficient to give it to a committee and say, think about this, because I think it's much more 
um, reasonable for a committee to have a proposal that you can tear apart and say, not this, but that. Um, so I think that that's what, that's what the recommendation is. And in that case, we would not act on this, but you would come back with something. If you want me to, yeah. That's, that's what this motion is. Right. Mandy, Joe, you, uh, Jennifer? I'm sorry. Yeah, I would think we'd want something. <clears throat> I can't, I don't think this should actually be referred. I think we need something more concrete, right. including, I think, your vision of who would be on this mm -hmm. commission. Thank you. So in other words, you really would like to see more of a charge attached to this before a referral is made. Right. Mandy yep. Jo? Yeah, I, I think part of the concern with maybe the motion here is that we're, we would tell Paul, do something, and it automatically goes to GOL without ever seeing what that proposal is. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of concern as to what that proposal is and whether we even think it's sufficient enough to talk about potentially adopting or modifying. Um, you know, one thing I've, I, I struggle with in trying to revise this, but maybe the first part is just, you know, stopping at transportation and parking commission period, like mm -hmm. with a date or something and not anything else mm -hmm. is, you know, it, from this conversation, it sounds like there's certain things that we are really hesitant to hand off delegation for, but then I can think of things that I wouldn't know how to modify our policy that we already have regarding control in the public way to hand it to a transportation um, commission, you know, but I could see speed bumps being something that maybe even though they're permanent changes to the public way that the council would be willing to delegate, um, you know, or additional stop signs. I think we've delegated some of those things, but I'm not sure the policy might not be clear. And so looking at the policy where we've already made some decisions, maybe tightening those decisions up and turning that into not just a charge for the commission, but also a modification of the policy that, you know, we come to next to potentially modify tonight mm -hmm. um, could be worth then, then we'd have something to talk about here as to whether it's worth referring, but I'm, I'm not sure I'm willing to pass a motion that says, oh, and well, it, it automatically goes just to GOL to talk about. So Mandy Jo, um, in looking at this, it seems to me that we want something where the town manager develop a draft charge for such a for a transportation and parking commission and submit it to the town council mm -hmm. for referral to and we can just for period. submit it to the town council period do we want to give a date so I would also include proposed changes to the town council policy regarding control and regulation of the public way because they would go hand in hand. Um, okay. So I'd like to see his proposals, proposed changes to that policy, but. Okay. Um, all right. Do you want to try a motion, Mandy Jo? Sure, I can try I, one. I um, think I got it. Um, if it was just as you said, Lynn. Mandy, do you want to? Or... I, I can ask, but I was going to ask Paul what date he could have something by so I don't pick a bad date. Yeah. It'll, it'll be after Labor Day. Okay, the end of September. Yep. So um, uh, I move to request the town manager develop a draft charge for a transportation and parking commission and proposed changes to the town council policy regarding control and regulation of the public ways um, and submit said proposal to the town council by September 30, 2023. Was that close enough, Athena? Yeah. Um, and... Okay. But Athena. you said September. Yes. September 30. Athena, okay. do you have a a different suggested motion? No, that's fine. Okay. Can somebody read the motion again before mm -hmm. I look for a second? The request the town manager develop a draft charge for transportation and parking commission and propose changes to the town council policy regarding control and regulation of the public ways and submit it to the town council by submit them 
to the town council by September 30, 2023. Okay. Is there a second? Second, Shalini. Okay. Uh, Michelle, you have your hand up. I'm going to vote yes for this, but I just wanted to say that it, it does seem like a lot of work for the town manager. And I know that's what you requested is to put a charge together. Um, but with so much sort of uh, controversy already um, that I'm hearing, I just would have preferred that we had further discussion or that a committee had further discussion to provide you more feedback before you go ahead and develop a charge that then we rip apart in September. So I will vote yes, but I, I just wanna say that would have been my preference. Shalini? Um, I think I'm good with the charge because he's you know, kind of highlighting what uh, the town council policy is and what that is. So I'm okay with that, but the additional changes because we haven't yet discuss that initial charge, which will then ref which we may end up changing and then and that would impact the changes to what Mandy Jo just added. So I'm wondering if we need to leave that out for now and just go with the charge and then based on what we end up deciding, then having him come forward with the other changes to the policy. Um, I hear you. Uh, Pat. Please use your mic, Pat. We can't hear you. I, yes, thank you. I wonder if it wouldn't be uh, more reasonable to ask you to have it by October, the end of October, instead of September, given everything that's happened, I or think, even November. I think that's more than reasonable to ask on that one. Jennifer? I was going to say the same. September 30th might okay. seem soon. Uh, there has also been a suggestion, however, that we really just focus on the proposed charge for a transportation parking commission and that come back to the council by October 31st and not add in the changes to the um, public way policy that we we see if the we we see if we want to go with the charge before we mess with the policy. Yes, Pam Rooney. It may just simply be per potential changes to policy just you know, as you come through the, the policy, what might likely need to be affected or what would be yeah. affected and, not, and likely need to be changed right. rather than a cast in concrete. Yeah. Right. Potential um, changes. Okay. Yeah. All right. Uh, with that, I do need a second. So there was a second, but with the friendly amendment, I'll take to October 31. Tw I'll, and I'll potential changes. And, and yes, yeah, the potential changes, not, you don't need the exact language, but I think it would be helpful to know exactly what on that policy that we've delegated would be continue, you know, would be added to the delegation. It might be obvious by the charge, but I don't know whether it would be. Okay. Next. Are there any further questions or comments? Pam, you have your hand up. No. All right. I believe I'm at Dorothy Pam. No, I think Shalini has to okay the October yeah, 31 I, change in the motion. Oh, okay. And also the use of the word potential. Yes. All right. So Dorothy? I would, I would vote yes at this point. Pam Rooney. Yes. Kathy Shane. Yes. Andy Steinberg. Aye. Jennifer Taub. Yes. Alicia Walker. Yes. Shelley Belmilne. Yes. Pat DeAngelis. Aye. Lynn Griesmer is an aye. Mandy Johanneke is aye. And Anika Lopes. Aye. And Michelle Miller. Aye. It's 12 counselors in favor and one absent. Um, we have one other item that was pulled from the consent agenda, um, and that is the actual proposed changes to the town council po policy regarding control and regulation of the public way. This was reviewed last time, and this would be the second reading, if you will, although not to clear that a second reading was required, but Pam, you pulled this, and I believe you explained to me, you confused it with the item we just dealt with. Okay. However, I'm going to now place the motion on the table to adopt the amendments to the town council policy regarding control and regulation of public way 
as shown on pages 19 to 22 of the motion sheet effective immediately. Is there a second? Second, DeAngelis. Okay. Is there any other comment or question? Okay, seeing none, I'm going to move to Pam Rooney. Yes. Kathy Shane. Yes. Andy Steinberg. Aye. Jennifer Taub. Yes. Alicia Walker. Yes. Shalini Balmilne. Yes. Kathy Angelis. Aye. Anna's absent. Uh, Lynn Griesmer is aye. Mandy Joe. Aye. Anika Lopes. Aye. Uh, Michelle Miller. Aye. And Dorothy Pam. Yes. It's unanimous with one counselor absent. We are done with the votes for the evening. And we are going to um, go to uh, Committee on Liaison Reports, uh, CRC, Mindy Jo. I think I covered most of it today during the answering questions. So there's, there's really not, we're almost, almost ready to get to making a recommendation on rental registration. So I'm hoping within the next month, you'll get, everyone will see that. Okay. Excuse me, elementary school building committee, Kathy. We are in the midst of design details, which include things like how white should the white brick be next to the red brick <laughs> and where the trim goes. So it's fun. But and and the designers were here in Amherst to walk the site to show us what the layout would be and also to bring materials. And that will continue. Uh, there'll be another in person um, in a couple of weeks. And then we go that design detail then will be the basis for another cost estimate. It's sort of at a, a there's a stopping point and they're getting ready to go before the conservation committee and commission and the planning board. So um, what we, we, we're meeting once a month as the full committee and then these interim pieces, the sustainability net zero committee will be meeting again, but this, the code that's changing the building code for everybody, the, some of the details still are not published yet. So we're trying to figure out how much it increases the cost of the school building. We know it's going to increase the cost of windows. We probably need triple, triple pane, but it looks like we're okay otherwise, but we can't meet until the guidelines come out so that the modelers can tell us this. So it's an interesting time period right now. Thank you. Andy, Finance Committee. Finance Committee has no report. Um, we sort of after uh, the budget process and the discussion that we had about uh, compensation needed a little bit of time off. So by the next meeting, we will have an agenda and the meeting plan going forward for the next round of work assigned to us. Okay. GOL, Jennifer. Oh, actually, no, it's not Jennifer. Uh, it is Pat. <laughs> you must be. It could be Jennifer. Um, if this is a real simple. Um, we have been, we were going to work on the zoning changes uh, that, but we did not receive the material from KP Law. So we have postponed that to the 19th, which is our next meeting. Uh, we looked at bylaws that have been brought forward by the bylaw review committee way back when. And we're just down, the committee is just down to, I think, two uh, bylaws that we're looking at, uh, regulations regarding animals and I forget. Historical commission. And the, the, yeah, which is a very minor change. We are waiting uh, for more information from uh, the town manager on the bylaws that have uh, been put out to DEI and other committees. Um, we're hoping to have that as soon as possible. Um, hopefully for in enough time to get it in the packet for the meeting on the 19th. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Anika, Jones Library Building. We have not met since the last meeting. Okay. TSO, Anika. So whomever missed our last meeting really missed out. Uh, we welcome back Dorothy Pam. 
we uh, had a an update on the, we actually went through the RFI for the Holler Bylaw, which was long awaited and exciting. And then we had a conversation about sustainability with the director of sustainability, Stephanie Ciccarello, which was a really wonderful um, presentation, incredibly informative, and that will be available on both on uh, their website and also to us all to be able to share. Um, so yeah, it was a it was a great meeting. Yeah. I've added uh, AHRA and asked Michelle to give us an update. The plan is for us to publish our report on August 17th in advance of the August 21st meeting um, in which the committee or as many members of the committee who are able to will be present um, to share our recommendations and our report with the council. Okay. Uh, liaison reports. Are there any liaison reports? See none. Uh, we've approved the minutes. Town manager's report, Paul. Yeah, so you will see some new faces in town hall. Uh, we have a community fellow uh, that's working, that's shadowing uh, Sean Mangano, Ray Thon, who, who um, went to Amherst Schools, has gone to Greenfield Community Colleges, and now at UMass and looking for a career in municipal finance. And this is a, a position that was funded by the state and requested that we host by the state. So that's a good thing. And thank you, Sean, for taking that on. Mm -hmm. uh, we also have two work study students. Some of the counselors who've been in the office have met one of them who started this morning. Uh, so we'll have two work study students in the town manager's office doing various things, mostly working with the CPOs um, and also covering the front desk when we have vacations and things like that. Um, Kudos to our recreation department for a terrific uh, Independence Day. Over 5,000 people were in attendance. Um, you know, it went really well. Uh, we've learned a lot and have had a debrief with our team about how we can do better next year. Um, the uh, health director, you know, we have the, the search is going on for that. I'll be sending you a memo appointing um, Dave Zomack as the temporary health director. He has served in that function before. Um, once in, I think Jen is here until the end of July. So uh, I'll give you, I'll send that to you in short time. Uh, police chief search. Uh, we have our consultant. Uh, we, you will be asked if you would like to participate in a one on one interview with our consultant. We'll do that with a number of other people on committees and former members of committees as well. Um, we've decided to hold on the public outreach until after Labor Day, since we've gotten a little bit later start than we anticipated. We don't, I don't think that would be wise for us to be trying to do public outreach during August. Um, so that will put us back a little bit, but we're still gonna try and move forward on it. We can get a lot of the interviews, the one-on-one -on -one interviews done uh, in advance of that. Um, the um, Crest Department, as you noted, has been part of the uh, Harvard's uh, Government Performance Lab. And we've had our first meeting with them. It's really exciting. Our team is very excited about being, participating in it. Um, I'm really proud of our team for being admitted into it. It's a pretty prestigious thing. I put a list of the communities who have been selected uh, for this cohort. So I think we're going to learn a lot. It's a lot of communities struggling with and trying to figure out alternative dispatch options, which is what we're talking about. This is not just alternative responders because the responders are not alternative. It's the dispatch that's alternative. So we're gonna be learning a lot in that process. Um, the Pomeroy Village roundabout is taking, is in really good shape. It's got, they've gone very quick. And I think people who've driven through it have been really, really like it. If you haven't, take a chance, take a drive down there and see what you think. Um, uh, Anika already mentioned the TSO committee. So Stephanie Ciccarello did a terrific job. And we hope to, with that presentation, to snip it and sort of publicize it so people can just watch that little segment. They don't have to watch the entire seat TSO committee meeting. And then two things for my neighbor here. Um, downtown Wi-Fi, uh, Sean and his team have been working very hard to upgrade all the Wi-Fi and have much more robust, secure Wi-Fi fixtures throughout the downtown area. Um, it's 500,000 square feet of coverage, something like that. And the other thing is that um, is we, he's also replaced the INET that 
throughout the town, but most importantly, we got a grant to extend the INET, which is our fiber network, all the way up to Mount Lincoln and Pelham, which is where our radio transformer is for public safety. And it saves us thousands of dollars that we had to pay for, to Verizon on a regular basis. I'm not sure. Wow. Do you know exactly the number? Nice work. It's roughly a thousand dollars a month. Yeah. yeah. So it's, it's yeah. Nice. So it's really exciting. So kudos to Sean for making all that happen. See, there's a reason. You, <laughs> there's, there's a reason you came to the there's meeting that. tonight. <laughs> Dorothy, you have your hand up. Um. I, I would just like a few more details about um, what you mean when you say the CRES is participating in a program at Harvard. Are they in, at Harvard University right now? Or are they, is it somebody from Harvard who comes to Amherst? No, so it's a great question. I wasn't clear about that. So the Kennedy School of Government has a, a unit called the Government Performance Lab. And this group takes on certain topics and they start to work with um, various groups about whatever it is they're doing. So in this one, they're really looking at alternative responders, alternative dispatchers, and they've been working with a number of communities. So it's more of uh, the term of art is community of practice. It's where other in, uh, entities that are doing the same thing get together and they share stories. They also give us one person who is our sort of guide in uh, supporting us. And so when we have questions, they, they meet weekly with our team and they'll say, our team doesn't go anywhere. Um, mm -hmm but it's part of a larger conversation. And it's just kind of impressive that they really wanted our team to be part of that larger conversation because you're looking at like Harris County, you know, Houston and Denver and Baltimore and right. Allegheny County and stuff. So it's kind of cool. Sounds wonderful. Thank you. Mandy Jo. Um, question on the RFPs. Um, it was used to be in your manager report and it's not anymore design guideline RFP that was voted now, I think for funding two years ago, has it gone out? And if so, when is, when are the um, proposals due? Design. We had, you had had funding for design guideline, uh, a consultant for design guidelines, I think in budgets for planning for two years ago, I think in the JCPC budget and planning has been working on it, but we haven't heard any updates as to when that RFP has gone out and when proposals would be due. I will check on that. Thank you. I don't have an update for you tonight. Okay. Shalini? I just wanted to, again, give kudos to uh, the CRES for getting into the Kennedy School uh, government because my recollection is we tried to do that before mm -hmm. and we were not able to because it's really challenging to get into this cohort. and. And as you mentioned, Paul, looking at all the other cities that got into like DC and Portland and Sacramento and Amherst. So that's like really cool that we will have this year long uh, participation in the cohorts and uh, guidance. And that's really amazing. So thanks to all the staff and the police and Cress and the fire and everyone who's been working together. And dispatch has been crucial to that as well. And they, the Harvard wants to do, they do their own press. So we can't do any press on this until they put their own stamp on it. So, but we will be putting it's this. Harvard. Out. Yes. Pat. Yeah, uh, a little bit more about press, please. Uh, from what I understand from talking to people in the, organ in the group, um, they are ready to go 24 seven. And they are ready for 911 calls. And so when you talk about dispatch and CRESS and how is that working out and how will decisions be made on which 911 calls to make and why, what's the timeline on this actually happening? Yeah, so that's the crux of the matter um, is one of the things that from going to one of these sessions but that uh, CRESS learned, at least the, the director learned, was that you don't start with too many calls. You start with a small, a relatively small sampling of calls that you really focus on and you get those right. Um, there is, it's a, it's, I think our responders are prepared and getting prepared uh, for that. There are some union uh, collective bargaining responsibilities that we have that we have to continue to meet, um, which we are doing. And, uh, but we're, we're expecting to move this forward uh, as soon as we can, um, once we meet our union bargaining obligations. Um, but in terms of the, pardon me? What's the impact on the on the on the dispatchers, and um, 
and how, how they're perceiving this new responsibility they're bringing on, they're, they're taking on. Um, in terms of the calls, we have a lot of different call types. We, you know, the LEAP report identified a whole bunch of calls. Um, and I think, you know, we're in real life, we're every weekend, we, we start to say, ah, that would have been a good Crest call. This could have been a good call. And even Crest itself is learning on a daily basis what works for them. I don't think they're looking at 24 seven. I'm not sure who's, I mean, the, the director certainly is not looking at 24 seven uh, coverage for Crest at this point. We, we don't have a budget for it, but also um, I think you can talk, we can talk to him directly, but you know, any call after 10 PM, very, I don't think any, program in the country it goes goes uh, operates after 10 p.m at night i think there i think one of them denver is going to start this year by going 24 7 but no other programs in the country could go that length but he can give us an update on that if you'd like michelle i'm not sure if this is a question for paul or or the council in general so um we received a state of human rights report um, it just occurred to me when someone else was speaking um, from the Human Rights Commission, and I don't know, is there an action that we're supposed to take to acknowledge or adopt or do something that um, lets the Human Rights Commission know that we've received the report and acknowledge it's, it? It's not in the list of groups which by the way, the Board of License Commissioners is in that group uh, that is required annually to report to the council. Um, so I didn't see any reason besides distributing it, which was done uh, for us to actually um, act in any way, even to accept the report. There are five, I think it's five reports that we are supposed to receive annually by virtue of the charter. And we tend to do that um, around the time of uh, beginning of December when we also do the state of the town address. Okay. So just to follow up, do they did they just do this? They just do this on an annual basis. Uh, what, what, what? I've never seen one before this year. Yeah, I can look. I don't think there's a requirement for them to do it. No. Okay. Doesn't no. prohibit them from doing no. it. You know. I mean, for instance, the housing. Uh, authority is required by the state to do one so that when they give up when they do ours they just handed us that report as their report so it's not a duplicate effort but i don't know of one for human rights commission okay well i just wanted to share that i really appreciated the report mm -hmm. and that they brought it forward yeah, absolutely uh pat I also appreciated the report, and I feel like while there is no requirement, it does seem that it would be valuable for the council to spend some time talking about the report directly and perhaps inviting um, the Human Rights Commission or some of the members to come forward and answer questions or share additional concerns with us. Okay, let me put that as a future agenda item. Are there any other questions of Paul? Um, yes. I might not have an answer, Paul, but I'm interested. I know the uh, I know the lottery for East Gables happened, and I thought there were something like 900 applicants. How how many do you know? How many of those folks were 30%? Uh, Area median income or less? No, I, I think probably I think it was a newspaper. I just that's the first time I saw it as well. Um, so I can I can find out from Valley. That would be great. I profiles. I did email Laura Baker, but I haven't heard anything. Okay. Thank you. Okay, um, your packet last time we met included the president's. Oh, I'm sorry, Pam. President's report, um, and. Uh, with regard to future agenda items, uh, I would like the council to, I guess the best way to do this is to say, our August 7th meeting is listed as if needed, okay? And based on that, I think it would be useful for the council to vote 
uh, that we meet on August 7th. And let me just mention that if we meet, it will be totally virtually because we don't have a neither um, neither of our count neither of our clerks, the Athena or Angela can be here. So the whole council would meet virtually, and that way we don't have to deal with the electronic issues of being in this room. Pam, you have your hand up. I could start by asking, what are the agenda items that, that we need to fit into an extra meeting? The uh, main agenda item that's coming up, and there are others, but none of them are as time sensitive, is in fact the zoning um, uh, bylaw amendment. And that is that is only if CRC, I mean, GOL, I'm sorry, that's only if GOL finishes its recommendation on clear, consistent, and actionable. Do we have the KP law? But do we have the KP law? Have they reviewed it? Paul that, emailed that we got, came today we to the just council. Got the, um, we just got KP law's opinion back today. You, it was just sent to you by Paul Bachelman. It, it's not in the packet, but it was sent to all counselors. Uh, Pam, you still have your hand up. I'm I'm waiting for um, unexpected items. Unanticipated. Oh, okay. Uh, okay, Michelle. So you're asking us to vote to maybe have a meeting on August 7th? No, it, it's, but GOL is telling us that they will be ready. So so are we having a meeting on August 7th? I would prefer that this be a vote of the council since it was listed as if needed. I have the right to call it, but I also want to honor the fact that People are on vacation. It was listed as if needed. Okay. What What are the consequences in terms of the timing of that proposal if we do not meet? Mindy, Joe, you're meeting? the one that has worked out the timeline. And so we, because the planning board has completed its hearing and we will have a planning board report and CRC has completed its hearing, and we will have a CRC report and GOL will have met, but it's really, Mandy Jo, correct me if I'm wrong on this, it's really X number of days after the planning board concludes its hearing. No? It, so I, I can answer that, but my hand's up for another yeah, reason, okay. which I'll, I'll, I'll ask that question before I answer this one, which is what's on the, August 21st agenda such that it would be more useful to have an August 7th meeting so that not everything, so that we don't go till 2 a.m. on August 21st, like that can't be moved off of August 24th. First, that would, that would be one question because um, there's other things coming up for August beyond just the zoning. Um, to answer the zoning question, CRC closed its hearing um, June 26th. Sixth, was that our meeting? Um, once CRC closes its hearing, the council must vote within 90 days or CRC or slash the council because the CRC holds the council required hearing. If the council does not vote within 90 days of the council's hearing closing, which is CRC's hearing, then the council slash CRC would have to hold another public hearing, including all of right. the notice provisions before it could vote. And act on the proposals. That 90 day deadline is in mid-September. Um, there are the August 7th meeting is exactly four scheduled meetings before the deadline is reached for the council. Um, I always recommend um, to the president that the council start its first reading four scheduled meetings before it must vote because there is always two potential right to postpone options 
after you get to the second reading. So you have to have two meetings before you <laughs> run out of time. But if counselors choose to use their right to postpone and then the further right to postpone, you're not past that 90 day deadline, that meeting would be August 7th to ensure that you don't get past that deadline. Um, can can I ask my other questions or my other things about no, future please agendas? Um, beyond what is already there, as I stated for CRC chair, um, rental registration will probably have a recommendation to the council um, in mid-August for the council to take up, which is a huge item too. And then streetlights was postponed from two weeks ago because of the length of that meeting. And so that needs taken up too. So rental registration is going to have to go to GOL first though. The referral was for us to send it back to the council and make a recommendation to the council. And right. then the council will need to decide whether it goes to GOL or it gets voted on or goes wherever else, but it'll need a full discussion at the council based on our recommendation. And has there been legal review? Yes. Okay. So. Um, and the AHRA is presenting on the 21st. <laughs> That's why I asked for what all is scheduled for the 21st. So I've got AHRA. You're telling me rental registration might be ready by then. I don't know whether GOL will have rules of procedure or bylaws by then. Um, and the other thing that you just mentioned was the streetlights. So that's what would be on the 21st. We were also supposed to get a report of the library. Thank you. Okay, so that's what's there. So by moving streetlights could go on the 7th uh AHRA is not ready by the seventh. Uh the bylaw, the uh duplex triplex bylaw um would be on the seventh. Um so the things that would move to the seventh that will be ready by the seventh are duplex triplex bylaw and street lights. That's the way I see it. Um, Cause I can't imagine GOL will get done with rules of procedure in time to bring that forward too. And the, we already did finish the other bylaws. Right. Okay. So, uh, just the to clarify, that, Lynn, with yes. the sorry, I didn't know the duplex would be um, a first reading. The street light would be a referral or a vote. It's actually responding to. So it was set for a potential vote. It it doesn't have any requirements for first and second reading because it's right. a policy, but. Um, the council has not had a time, a chance to yet talk about TSO's recommendation. And there were a lot of comments, so. Yeah. So on the 7th, we would do street lights. We would do, um, Duplex, triplex. Zoning bylaws. Zoning amendments, right? And we could do the um, uh, leftover, leftover bylaws. Okay. There we go. That's so what would be on the 7th. A point of order. Yes. Was this potential vote considered and anticipated by you more than 40, less than 48 hours ago or more than 48 hours ago versus just taking a sense of the council? Just trying to get a sense of the council. So it's not a formal vote? No. Okay.
sounds like we have to meet. <laughs> Fine. We'll have a meeting on the 7th. 7th at 6 o'clock, 6.30, will be totally virtual. 6.30, totally virtual. Okay. Uh, are there any other comments? Lynn. Paul. Oh. So I just want to go back. I did look at the, the on the human rights report. So the, the town's bylaw requires the commission to shall annually prepare and submit to the town manager and town council report on the state of human rights in Amherst. Mm -hmm. That's so that's the, they're responding to their okay. bylaw. Okay. Okay. Um, so I don't know whether I'll try to schedule that on the seventh or just put it later. Can I respond to yes. that? Yes. In the past with other reports, we've just simply had a vote acknowledging receipt. Yeah, right. But if the council wants to speak with the Human Rights Commission, that's different. Uh, one of the members has literally just moved out of, out of state but might, one of the co-chairs, but might be willing to, well, okay. Um, okay, so we're having a meeting on the 7th at 6.30. Virtually. Uh, seven people have indicated that they are available. Uh, a few people indicated that they, might be able to be available and three people indicated they are not available okay all right anything else topics not reasonably anticipated i would like to acknowledge two things and one is that today is sean's anniversary and he's spending it with us thank you sean <laughs> <laughs> the second is that that Kelly Miller is moving to uh, Seattle, and this is her last in-person meeting with us. She'll be helping out, but she's pursuing her PhD at the University of Washington, and she's moving. Anything else? If not... I'm sorry, yes. Go ahead. Um, I don't really want to have a discussion at this hour tonight about it, but I did want to bring this up and it was not anticipated because it really came out of last week's and then was um, this week's public comment session. I would like us to consider having GOL uh, look at the rules of procedure again about uh, the public comment period, there were a couple things that I think that we need th them to talk about. One is uh, whether it is appropriate for somebody to ask to be recognized and then um, turn over their time to somebody else, particularly somebody who has already spoken. Uh, but it's really not necessary. That's the only reason that it is done. And I would like, I don't want to have the discussion. I would like GOL to have that discussion. And I certainly didn't want to have the discussion during public comment, but of course, because it's not our rule, but I think we should talk about it. The other thing was raised by uh, Pat during the uh, discussion in public comment. And I think that we really um, might want to give some more feedback to the president about what the process ought to be um, and the policy ought to be for enforcing the time limit because uh, it did create an awkwardness as was uh, yep. noted and I'm not gonna get into the details. So I, I just um, would really like to have the appropriate committee spend a little bit of time thinking about those issues on behalf of the council. Okay. And one of the protections is having a consistent policy that is uh, that is enforced consistently. Well, 
it's for our protection as a yeah. Okay. Are there any other comments or questions? I have to look at my screen. Sorry. Um, if none, the meeting is adjourned at ten thirty-seven. Good night, everyone.